All right. I think we are live. Well, I'm Hello. here today with Casey Robin. This is a treat. Thank you so much for joining me, Casey. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. Fun. And uh, yeah, so I'll tell you what, just because um, I, I don't know if people are familiar with you, I don't know how many people are, are going to be here from uh, your following, uh, but why don't you just give a really quick description of who you are and what you do? Sure. So I am an illustrator and designer, and I work in animation, toys, books, and sometimes games. And I basically make really cute stuff in a variety of ways. So I work for Disney Publishing doing character paints, where it's my job to like, take the black and white inks of the princesses and make them look lovely and put like their blush on and the light and the shadow and everything. And then I also design quite a few things myself. I'm known for my work in pinups. In fact, I'll be designing dresses for pinup girl clothing who made this little number here. And I'm very excited for that. I have kind of a, an affinity for retro things. Um, I make teas with my brother and I do art for the tins and he does uh, the tea mixing. And then I do illustrations for storybooks and projects like that. Wonderful. And you know, it's funny, Casey, as I was looking through your Instagram, I realized you had for the Darjeeling tea. Yeah. That picture, I, it was one of my favorite pictures of yours and I didn't realize it was for the tea collection. Yeah, it's for tea. So I basically took each tea, took the characteristics of that tea and designed a character around it. And the whole line was inspired by like the Ziegfeld's Follies and Follies Bergere and kind of like sexy art from the turn of the century. So like it was scandalous in the 1900s, like early 1900s or late 1800s, but now it's just like quaint and cute. Neat. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. All right. So I'm curious because uh, I don't know how, how in depth we even got uh, uh, into this just in general talking one on one. But how did you actually get your start with Disney storybook art? Oh, that was, it was a long process and I wasn't even aware that I was engaging in that process. So basically I had had a history with Disney. I started as a story artist in their uh, like talent development program when I was younger. I mean, younger, like mid twenties. Um, and they co-directed a short there and all that. But then I kind of went to pursue my own style of things. And then I, I moved to LA and I just got, started getting to know people. So I, I did a few gallery shows with Center Stage Gallery. That's part of the Creative Talent Network. So there are a lot of people from Disney who come around there. And through that, I got to know Adrian Brown Norman, who's an art director at Disney Publishing. And I didn't really think anything of it. I just thought, oh, she's cool. What a cool job. That's awesome. And in fact, I had met her at, at a... Um, event at Club 33, which was the very day I decided it's time to move to LA. This is exciting. And then um, like two years later, I was going to an opening for one of Lorelai Beauvais shows, a little cafe just in, uh, oh, I think Silver Lake or somewhere. And Adrian walks up to me and is like, do you want to work? And I'm like, yeah, what have you got? And she's like, princesses do you want it and I'm like yeah I want princesses I love princesses I mean I'm really girly so I was excited for that and then she had me take the background test which I think I bombed she didn't say I bombed it but I felt like I did but I'm like can I please take the character test because I'm much better with characters than backgrounds so I took that and then she just came back saying I would like you to do paints for Bell to the Rescue and that was my first Disney storybook and now I've done lots and lots more and I just worked on a Moana one. And this is very exciting to work with all these different characters. Some of them are ones I grew up with. I mean, Belle, gosh, you know, and Ariel. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's got to be a lot of fun to work on the characters that you found enjoyable as a, as a child. That's something that I've been yeah. able to uh, finally understand with, uh, with ukulele, just to, yeah. to get a chance to work with these. Uh, I mean, granted, it wasn't ukulele, but it was it was characters that inspired you. It was Banjo-Kazooie, right? I mean, I think that's yeah. what all of us came to ukulele, loving Banjo-Kazooie in some way or another. Mm -hmm. So I found a right. way immediately to turn it back to me. So let's stay on, let's stay yeah. on what no, we're that's talking right. about here. I and also loved, I think, I want to say, I think the character design in ukulele is super appealing. I really enjoy looking at them and just their faces are so charming. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's uh, you know, I, I I have to thank uh, Steve Mails, the uh, who was the foundation artist for the characters, because yeah, you know, he, he goes all the. I don't know if you know who that is, but he goes all the way back to the the history of. I'm pretty sure it was at least majority Steve. He uh, he, he goes all the way back to the Donkey Kong Country days. On the Super oh Nintendo. my god, I beat those. I played so many hours of Donkey Kong Country, especially Donkey Kong Country Two, 
Because Dixie yeah. Kong is best Kong. Big, like absolutely, hands absolutely, down. absolutely. There's no, there's no contest. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, um, uh, yeah. He 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 goes a ways a ways back. So it, it's a great foundation for. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, you know, you know. I mean, you you no doubt have evolved characters. I mean, in your own way, you've had to redraw characters. Yeah. And it, well, and I also do design for my own projects. I'm doing character design, and I study character design under Bill Schwab at Disney. So he showed me his approach to a really shape based thing, and I think you see that beautifully in ukulele. The silhouettes are so crisp and clear, you know, and they look so distinct from one another. Yeah, a few a few people had noted that I really kind of, uh, to some degree, a kind of elongated yuka. But the funny part about the that I realized, I'm like, man, I don't really, re I didn't really realize I made him that kind of stretched out. But then I, I remembered that at the beginning, the first pages, the ones that I've shown are where he is uh, kind of at his skinniest and, and spindliest. And he actually kind of <laughs> normalized a little bit throughout the book. And so I, I need to kind of revamp those pages a little bit just to bulk him up a little bit. But he, he didn't have a lot to he play He needs to with. eat a few more butterflies. <laughs> yeah, Laylee's always stealing them from him. But he, yeah, I think he, he, she would. He, he needs, a, he needs a, a lot of range to pose. So maybe, you can, maybe yeah. you can talk a little bit on this. So one of the challenges that I run into when I'm, when I'm working on, on the books, I, I, I do think like an animator is trained as an animator. Oh, yeah. So I'm always thinking about what I call the before and after. With a, with a pose, you know. Yeah, you're your, drawing... your storytelling poses. Sure, I mean you can call it your keys, right? I mean, but I mean the the uh, that your beat poses, however you want yeah. to refer to it. But the idea of having an idea of how the character got to that point, what they're feeling uh, due to where they just were and where they're going after this, is both uh, the, the both of those are important to understand. So I'm wondering, uh, do you think about that when you're doing illustrations? Yeah, I mean, I think I think about shape. First, um, when I'm doing an illustration, I mean, I guess what I think of is I think of the emotion and I try to feel it in my body. And then I try to project that onto the page in shapes. But I do think of the gesture first. I think of the line of action. So if, if Yuka is running, like I'm going to be really working along that line of action. And if the body needs to distort to really sell that run, I say go for it mm -hmm. if it looks right. I yeah. mean, there's a certain, certain point has a certain point past which if you distort a character too far the model kind of breaks and they start to look like it hurts to be them and you never want to get that far but i think you have to be able to be flexible with your characters to animate them and to get them to act i mean disney ran into this with mickey mouse for the i think it was the brave little tailor fred moore redesigned mickey mouse and gave him more of a torso uh, torso and then belly so that he could do this little you know, um, action of like gearing himself up for a fight, taking a breath with the, the really round body, like he couldn't do that. So we had to give him a torso, lengthen him a little bit, make mm -hmm. his limbs a little bit longer to get the action he needed. And Walt saw it and he's like, who did that? Who redesigned Mickey? And, <laughs> and, and Fred's like, me. <laughs> uh, and Walt's like, all right, everyone, that's how I want Mickey drawn from now on. You know, that, that was a good day for him. It was a good day for Fred. It was a, it was good a day gratifying for day. Prior to that point, everyone's probably making oh, yeah. fun of him. I'm like, oh, look at Mr. Torso, yeah. Billy. Really. You can't yeah. draw, can't That's draw Mickey, the way right. you, Mickey, you made yeah. him too tall. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's a, another another point of interest that that was it was a challenge with with the book, and maybe you have some thoughts to offer on this as well. Sure. Uh, is the contrast between the characters? So um, to some degree, oh yeah, I, I love I, that about I'm the trying team. to amplify the. You know, because when you're when you're playing the game. And you're playing a game like like ukulele or you know basically yeah. any game that is like a Mario game is really the same way. You're generally just kind of staring at the butt of the character like for eighty percent of the game. <laughs> and so in order to make it interesting, uh, you know you have to mainly focus on exaggerated poses for movement within the game. But in the book, there's a lot of yeah. close ups. There's a lot of uh, interactions uh, where you kind of get right up on the characters' faces. Well, I was really disappointed that we saw their faces in the book. I think they should have been facing away from us. Like, in <laughs> well, the game. It's, not, it's not authentic. <laughs> it's not authentic. No, it's really not. You really <laughs> missed the mark You there. have too many shots of faces in here. That's got to yeah. change. So, yeah, it does. Um, it's no, I, I agree. I think that in the gameplay, you're focused on action. And so the body's acting in real time with your inputs are really important and that's what's focused on. Mm. And they do have great facial animations when they have them, but it's not the main focus because the main focus of a game is of course gameplay. Mm. But then mm. when you're talking about a graphic novel, the focus is on storytelling, therefore acting, therefore camera mm. shots, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, so yeah. of course you need to like prioritize 
faces. And I think it's fun to play with the, the, the range of expression, particularly, I think, with Laylee, because she's so sassy and her expressions are so big. Mm -hmm. I really love her little, like, in the game, she has this little resting smile. It's like, yeah, <laughs> it's like a little, a little bit crazy. It's a wide and I like it. She's got a rictus, yeah, like a rictus grin. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. kind of frightening. Yeah. She can kind of chomp through your head. Uh, right? that, that, that's fun. That, that's fun to play, you know, because throughout the book, there's a lot I haven't shown a lot. I haven't shown in terms of some of the kind of crazier expressions that happen throughout the book. Yeah, one, no, one I'm section, of, probably the craziest section would be the cart, the section with, uh, with Cardos, you know, the, the, yeah, yeah. Cart. The mine cart, the mine cart that, that is, might be one of my, I would say my favorite part of the, the story. Cause it's so absolutely jam packed with terrible humor. It's just <laughs> ever just the worst and it's I so like much ton much humor myself so i think me and the the rare slash platonic developers have a similar sense of humor i'm like dr quack because he's a duck but he's also a quack <laughs> get it <laughs> i'm like ah <laughs> yes they are the uh, they are the punniest guys alive i love that yeah. and i like how much of that made it into the comic how much uh -huh. of the wordplay and the, the, the visual gags and the puns and the, the overall cartooniness. And I feel like the sense of humor that you have a very similar sense of humor to the platonic guys where it's uh -huh. a lot of kind of cheesy puns, but they, they say them with such gusto, you know, <laughs> and then a lot of big uh -huh. expressions, a lot of squash and stretch cartoony stuff. I'm excited to see that Cartos page. Mm. I, I haven't seen that. I'd be freaking yeah. out if I was on a Cartos ride it's kind of rickety well it's it, i think the thing that makes the scene work is is, is uh, as it does is because cardos can't really hear very well because the, the, yeah. the running joke is that he's from the dkc era and he's he's getting old oh, and uh and he can't hear what you just telling him and he's got to rush they're trying to rush they're on a race trying to catch up with something <laughs> and cardos is just not able doesn't understand it he, re, he redefines everything yuka says into something else um and so that just the <laughs> The, the, the dynamics between Yuka like in a panic trying to rush and Cardo saying, what? <laughs> yeah, it's what? Just... You want me to go faster? No! <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, there's, and there's a lot of nods to the, the challenge of cart levels. You know, oh, you probably gosh. remember with Donkey Kong how, oh, yeah. how tough those levels can be. And I, that becomes a, a running joke within that scene because the, they're constantly falling off the tracks and, and there's, there's holes. In the oh, I, I jumped into so many chasms in DKC. And I like, I'm just like, I, I just jumped right into that like a lemming. It's like I knew it was inevitable. So I just, boom, into my death, you know? Yeah, yeah. And you just play the same thing like 30 times and it's a fourth of a second timing that gets you over that last wasp, mm. you know? But it's so or satisfying just, when you make it. It is. And like not very many checkpoints back then. So it was no. really harrowing to, and I actually went back and, and played um, the newer Donkey Kong Country, Donkey Kong Country, Return of Donkey Kong Country, Donkey Kong Country there, Returns. There are, there are two new ones, yeah. Yeah, the not Tropical Freeze, the other one on my 3DS. Mm. And oh my God, the mine carts were hard. Yeah. I had, I had minecart skills. I have since lost them. So I'm glad the ukulele is keeping the minecart thing so I can keep up on that. And it, mm -hmm. it is nostalgic for and me. It's, it's, it's very hard, DKC. Hard, hard in ukulele. They're very too. hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the difficulty level is, you know, it's, it's part of feeling accomplished is having overcome something that was truly difficult that wasn't just a task, you know, like collect 10 of these things you know it's like no no i like hit it right at the right moment and it was amazing mm -hmm. and i almost died but then i didn't and i died like 30 times before that but i got it yeah yeah you know? now i want to interrupt really quickly so just so sure. people know uh if you want to ask any questions go ahead and write them in the chat and i will bring oh, yeah. them up right to casey here. and if you have any questions for me for whatever reason uh, I will do my best to answer. Uh, so just go ahead and, and, and write them up and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll read them out as you type them. So yeah. Well, so, I have a question. So, what's that? I have a question. How's the campaign going? Oh, it's good. It's good. Yeah. We're, yeah. um, we're, we're about a, yeah, we're both. I've been kind of watching, but I just. <laughs> it's just peeking around. Yeah. I've been peeking and, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a day over a weekend and we're, we're very yeah. close. We're about 83, 84%. I haven't checked. That is so exciting. I think last time I checked, it was at 75 and I'm just like, come on guys, keep it going. Yeah. yeah. The momentum well, you know, is exciting. Right. Yeah. I mean, not to get into the analytics of it, it's not terribly exciting, but you know, what happens with Kickstarters a lot is, um, they have kind of an excitement in the beginning. They have an excitement right. at the end. And then there's kind of what, what Kickstarter, I guess, calls the trough. 
which is yeah, in the alone. middle where it kind of just loses a lot of steam because it's not an exciting time. And so you have to work very hard to keep interest up. So I'm just constantly reaching out. Well, you've been uh, posting and, about the new rewards and stuff. That's pretty cool. That's yeah. Exciting. And th those are, those are going to be fun. Although I have to say that the cloth map is um, giving me some serious trouble. Oh, really? And uh, yeah, well, just in terms of production, it's, I'm going to bring this up in the uh, backer update tomorrow, but I've been trying to get the cloth map done. It's easy enough to get a print done on cloth. And I can, sure. I, I was actually looking into satin Ooh. Uh, Ooh. and, and it's, it's, it's really neat, but the problem is not the, the printing. The problem is finishing the edges. So it doesn't fray. Oh. And, they, oh. and if you want something that's not going to fray and get destroyed, you have to do some finishing work to the edges. You either have to sew something like or seams like, or, or, or you have to do like bias tape or you have to do so like, yeah, exactly. There's seams or embroidery on the edge works, but it's Ooh. very hard to find a location that can a vendor basically that can do both of those things. Oh, really? I've never yeah. looked into getting a, a cloth map made. Well, here's, here's what I'm thinking. And I don't want to, I don't want to really um, update the backers just yet on this, but uh, with any promises, but the thing I think will kind of blow the cloth map out of the water, actually, that would actually be more doable, cost cost a little bit more money for me to do, but I think it would be really worth it, is a laser engraved woodblock map. Ooh. Ooh. So I can, I can get uh, like a, a flat you know, piece of wood that actually has mm -hmm. engraved line art onto it, and it would just be the coolest thing. And that, that sounds cool. That's doable. I just don't, I, I need to try and find the right vendor for it. And unfortunately these things take a while. Of course, it's in the best interest of the campaign to get the tier up as soon as possible. So people can upgrade their pledges. You know, the sooner people do that, the sooner we, uh, we, we get a, a big jolt toward the goal. And, yeah. But uh, like, you're, you're pretty close. Right? We're, we're, we're pretty close yet, but you know how, you know, it's this, the Kickstarter psychology. These are things that most people when they're in the middle of Kickstarters don't talk about, but I don't care. Well, the fact of the matter is when you, when you reach the end of the campaign, uh, people uh, who might be on the sidelines who feel a bit more confident about the campaign because they know it's going to, it's knowing it's going to make it. And right, so right. they feel more confident putting money into it. And Cause it is right. disheartening if you're like, Oh man, I can't wait to get this comic book. I'm going to put in money and it didn't get funded. But I feel yeah. like this one is so close. Like I think we're, yeah. Yeah. And I so mean, Right. Of course, so, we still need people to join, but like it's it's exciting. It's almost there. It, yeah, and you know, and of course, we've got some exciting stretch goals. So I um I, I think I, I kind of alluded last night that I was going to introduce a surprise stretch goal uh, that's going to be kind of right in between because it's it's going to be pretty tough to get up to that top one, and the one the, the fourth secret one that I haven't announced yet. And I don't want to announce it yet. Uh, Ooh, secret is yeah, it's <laughs> it, it's going to be rad, and it, it involves a, a partnership with somebody that will excite fans. I just I really want to get Ooh. there, so I'm I'm going to try and modify. So what can I get do. Grant Kirkhope to follow me around and score my life live as it happens? Like I already, I already music got music. I already got for when I'm typing it. up yeah. emails. Good, good, yeah, good, he's, good. He's writing theme music for for me right now, so I'm sure he. Can oh, good. Just the just the, the, <laughs> just the <brief laughs> theme music. <laughs> All right, let's see yeah. what we got here. All right, looks like we got a question here. Uh, this is from Jonathan. A question for Dave. What do you think the chances are of having an official banjo cameo in the book? Oh, boy. Have you <laughs> had any of these uh, discussions? I think Microsoft might have something to say about that. They, they, don't, they don't have to know. Don't tell them. Uh, <laughs> would it be in the yeah, don't tell them. Live on YouTube. I Yeah, in terms of cameo, so, here, so here's what I'll say about cameos because I don't want to give anything away. But there, there's stuff in there that if you're a banjo fan, it will, it'll, 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 it'll tickle you uh, hmm. as to whether or not Banjo himself is in the book. I can pretty much just say no, because I don't, I would love to put, put him in there, but I don't like, that's just but does Lily, like, the wrath does like you go like it's, you know, I, I don't want to get them angry at me. I'm, I, I'm not, yeah. a, I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not going to put up a fight against Microsoft <laughs> and you know, not just Microsoft, but rare. I mean, part of it, part of it also is like an honor system between studios. I mean, you know, right. Platonic and Rare have a good relationship. And uh, and intellectual property rights are a real thing. You know, well, when you're really working are. on a professional level, you really have to be respectful of who owns what because it, yeah, it matters. I can't just take banjo. I mean, it, it's it's a tough thing to do. But I, but here's another thing I will tell you. Uh, I would love to do a Banjo-Kazooie book. Oh, that'd and be fun. That is something that has come up in a few conversations. I can oh, I just, I want to see Gruntilda just do her thing. Just, mm -hmm. you know, plot and oh, scheme, man. but all like, oh, yeah, all, yeah. all hand drawn. All yeah, yeah. And she would be, you yeah, know, because the, the polygons are expressive to a point. 
Oh, she's and then so, you just really, so I, I, I love Gruntilda. Because yeah, <laughs> I'm to... always the one who loves the, the high, high camp. Like when I was a kid and I was watching Power Rangers, I'm like, Team Rita. Yes, let her like be as over the top as she wants to be. I'm there for that. <laughs> so yes. Gruntilda in Banjo-Kazooie was just the best. Yeah, and then she yeah. spoke in rhyme. You could have so much fun writing that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it would be a ton of fun. Well, well, you know, I've said in in a, uh, I think it was the interview with the, uh, the good folks at the Conversation, uh, that uh, what a great name, and a great mm. theme song, uh, <laughs> yeah. is uh, that that when I wrote the story to Yuka, it was um, it was originally I knew very little about Yuka because that so little work had been done on the story at the time. This was really right mm. after the Kickstarter had completed for the game, so they didn't really have much of an idea of what. Well, as soon as I saw gameplay, I was pretty much on board. I'm just like collectibles. You've got the team character. It looks cute. I'm. I'm on board. Well, that was that beautiful E3 2016 trailer. It was perfect. Aww. And then, uh, uh, you know, and so basically I had to write the story for Banjo-Kazooie. So in a way, Yuka is kind of a Banjo-Kazooie style book, but uh, sure. but then the characters come into their own. So since we've really sidetracked into uh, uh, geeking out uh, about uh, Donkey Kong Country, uh, talking about mine <laughs> yeah, cards, talking about Kong. Yuka, and, and, and just getting into that, um, I, I, I want to turn this back to you on... Uh, on, on your books a little bit, if you don't sure. mind. So now, to date, now, how, 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 what is your favorite project that you've had a chance to work on? I'm curious. Oh, that's such a big question. Um, okay, it might have been the hardest, but um, at Disney, I got to work with a team of, of 13 other artists on an animated short called Chalk, which was something we conceived and executed in six weeks. And it was crazy. I mean, it was, it was like, uh, kind of a project runway energy in there. And it was lots of long nights. I think I slept overnight at the studio at least once because the music had to be approved and I was the only one who could approve it. And it came in at like three in the morning. Um, but it was so neat to have everybody doing their their own individual thing on a larger whole and have it all come together to be something more than any one of us could have done on our own. Um, I also was very pleased to work on the, um, the Valentine's dress for pinup girl clothing this last year. I got to draw like just the girliest stuff and I'm, I'm, I'm a real girly girl. So it was fun for me to indulge. And then it was wonderful to see it on an actual garment and then to see people post pictures of that, of them feeling pretty in something that I helped to make pretty, like it, it really meant a lot, you know? Because when I was a teenager, I was very, very not pretty. And I was very obsessed with female beauty, like the beauty goddesses of like uh, Marilyn Monroe and Audrey Hepburn and what makes them pretty. And so much of my work came out of that curiosity that started when I was younger. Right, right. And if it makes you feel any better, when I was a teenager, I also was not very pretty. Many teenagers aren't. And yeah. I was, I looked very different than I look now. I was like plus size and my hair was a lot darker and, and I was just wearing kind of gothy clothes because I didn't know what to wear. I just wanted to look mm. cool. I didn't know what goth was. I just knew that like black equaled cool, you mm. know? Okay. So, okay. Um, now, I, but I, to... yeah, I would say the Disney short or the pinup girl dress have been really fun projects. Now I want to ask you more questions about those in one second. We've got sure. a, 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 someone in the chat who just has the best name. This is the official frogadier. <laughs> nice. So I don't know what, like what a frogadier is, but, it, but since there's an official one here, but I'm with whatever that is. Like, yeah. I'm on it, board. It's, it's impressive. Now, now official frogadier said, uh, and I'm guessing this is a reference to something and I don't know what it is, but okay. he said, ah, oh, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta make it. Is that from, is that a song? What is that from? I don't know. That's not ringing any bells. Yeah, I don't know. Well, Elaborate, anyway, for, Frogadier? Uh, so, I well, don't. okay. Well, this, this is a, this is an insider Frogadier joke, I guess. So uh, I guess. quick question for Casey from this Frogadier. Uh, oh, yeah. how, long, how long have you been an illustrator? Uh, since, officially, since I was 14. That was my first professional job. I illustrated a Young Women of Faith journal for Zonder Kids, and they needed 175 pages of pen and ink drawings in like two months. And I did it. Oh, that's and old. it funded, yeah, I know, right? Uh, and it was my first job. So I didn't know that that was unusual. Uh, they had had troubles where they couldn't find the right artist. And then by the time they found me, uh, they were way, like, I guess they were kind of behind. So <laughs> that funded my trips to. Uh, Europe. So I guess that was, gosh, that was almost 20 years ago. So almost 20 years. I'm turning 34 in like two weeks. 
Hey, three weeks. happy birthday. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Gonna go to the Tama Shander, get some shepherd's pie. That's the uh, cute little Scottish pub where Walt and his story guys used to go and like talk story. Oh, really? Yeah, it's a nice little pub. You can get like a Guinness and like a meat pie and is, is spend that all where you need. is that in Burbank? Uh, it's in Atwater Village, which is kind of near Glenda. It's near Burbank. Okay, It's all right. just outside. I know there there was a there was an English pub in, on on Magnolia and Burbank that um I wanted to go to, but Story I never Tavern? it might it might have been. I don't know the name, but it Oh, I know no, I that's wanted not to Magnolia. I know I wanted Yeah. to go, but I, I never got the chance. I like pubs in general. I like to get me a beer and some food. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> well, a pint. You got to get like a pint. good, good food, like fish and chips. Fish and chips, yeah, good. Well, uh, we have very good fish and chips over here, actually. Really good fish and Yay! chips. In fact, there is an official uh, fish and chips. They call what is it? The something inst something institution, the British institution here. Uh, I don't know the name of the company, but they make fish and chips, and it's not as good as the local stuff. I got to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, Jonathan says, I think he was referring, oh, he was referring to the Kickstarter goal. Yes, of course. We got to Ah, make it. We oh, got to yeah, make it. no, we got to make it for That's sure. right. That's, so if anybody has, what do we, what do we need? About seven, 7,000. So if anyone has $7,000 lying around right now, you can pour it Or into the 7,000 Kickstarter campaign. friends with one dollar. Does anybody have either of those? Anybody? <laughs> I don't Yes. have seven thousand friends. <laughs> Anybody? Anybody? No. All right. But I think just, no, seriously, just a few of friends who are into Banjo-Kazooie, Donkey Kong Country, ukulele, that kind of stuff, just let them know. Like, I was just like, ukulele comic, I want one. And then I ordered one. You Yes, know, that's, I also I think, wanted how it happens. I also wanted one, but it wasn't being made and I had to get on it. Yeah, <laughs> get so on it. uh uh Brian <clears throat> Brian says, Dave, can you go through the process of how you went about setting up conversations with Platonic to use their properties? Was it difficult to get a hold of them to get the conversation started? Uh it was actually a little bit difficult because in the beginning, this is not a terribly exciting story, but I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna soup it up. I'm gonna make up a bunch of things that didn't happen. I'll I'll, I'll embellish Just them. add See a if bear. see, see if you can figure out the things that are not true in, in the in the following story. And you win a prize. Uh, so basically I started talking to them. Um, I actually started talking to Grant Kirko before the Kickstarter for the game even took place. This is, I, I talked to him probably as early as 2013. Um, Oh, wow. yeah, back, back when, uh, I, I had, I was in contact with Grant cause we were both working in, as game professionals and Grant had moved to the States to work with a company uh, called big, huge games. Uh, on the kingdoms of Amalur. And uh, I still don't know how to pronounce it. Amalur, Amalur, I Amalur. don't know. Amalur, Amalur. Anyway, it was a, it was a fantasy RPG game. And I feel like I'm repeating myself. I think I just talked about this Actually, in a different one of my format. first jobs out of school was working on a fantasy uh, MMO, MMO RPG. Well, that was, that was what this was. And it was a first for Grant. And he, when he came to the States, uh, yeah, he was in Baltimore. The studio did one job and then he was, he was out of work and he was thinking about moving to, Los Angeles area because he always wanted to live near the beach as he as he said uh, at least I think he said because I can't understand what he's saying half the time uh, but he, he He's seemed like, to mom, be mom, mom. he seemed to be interested yeah, he speaks in gibberish right yes yes that was not that was legitimate voice acting. it wasn't a computer program good <laughs> very few voice actors are well versed in the, the gibberish yeah yeah game. very few people can pull off the banjo voice Uh, uh, and, uh, so he moved and at the time I was at insomniac, uh, games and we were just talking and chit chatting about ideas. And I said, you know, how wonderful would it be? And this is back in 2003. So I'll credit myself for getting Platonic. So I, yes. so I told Grant, you know, get the band together because I just want to play another, another banjo game. If you can hurry up about it too, because it's been like 90 years. And, uh, it turns out that they had already been talking about some stuff and then it turned into Platonic. So. When the Kickstarter was revealed, I, I reached out to Grant again and I said, uh, you know, I'm really interested in doing a, a book based on a game. I've been talking to a few studios, you know, but nothing really phased out. It wasn't the right time for anything in particular. And uh, so, you know, can you get me in touch with, with Platonic? And, and, and he did. And we, we spoke, but it just it wasn't the right time. And they said, maybe it's going to be about another. I think they told me that it would, it would be almost like a year until they were ready to begin talking about story. And so I reached back out to them like a year later and uh, I don't think they were expecting me to. And uh, I did. And uh, so at that time, uh, Team 17, which is the, uh, the publisher of the game, 
uh, was uh, kind of handling all of the, the, well, the publishing of the game, as well as any sort of ancillary stuff. Uh, you know, if there was any ukulele products made, it was handled by Team 17. Yeah, I wouldn't and, mind figures, you know. Yeah. Like well, the action I, figures. I was thinking about that for the Kickstarter, but that's a really complicated game. <laughs> no, that's a whole other project. That's, that's a, whole a Kickstarter other world. in and of itself. That, exactly. Yeah, the ukulele action figures or statues. Yeah, down, <laughs> down the road on that one. That's why that, well, I will get on that tangent. But, well, that's something to leave to the people who make action figures. I don't even want to be that person. Yes, yes. But I would buy one. I, I, I would too, as long as the company actually delivers, unlike that other company that made the ukulele statue that ran away with the money. But that's another story. Um, <laughs> some people here might be familiar with that, that mess. So basically, uh, with, uh, with the Platonic, I approached them a year later, and I got passed on to Team 17 to kind of work things out. And it was the head of Team mm -hmm. 17, Debbie, uh, who had really pushed that project immediately into production like he, you know she just kind of took over and she said this looks great let's do it and then um she kind of gave uh gavin price who's the head of the, the company just some suggestions on how we could work together and everybody just seemed to be on board Ga gavin is is like he, he's so open to crazy ideas it seems <laughs> as was evidenced throughout the development of the book where i would send him something that i thought was way way outlandish I, it, nobody would ever put this kind of thing in a book and he's, he's like that sounds good you know <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff in the book that you will not normally see in in graphic novels i like weird stuff yes I'm all for then it. suddenly aliens came down from space yeah. and they zapped me with a, a phaser gun and suddenly i was imbued with the powers of graphic novel production sounds legit Yep. Yep. All of this is true. And then I got to work on the story and that was pretty much it. it just, from that point on, it was just sharing stuff with them. So the story, was it kind of one and done on the story? Like you knew what you wanted to do with these characters and then it was just a matter of polish after the first pass or did I, you have to kind of find the story? I had a, I had one idea I really wanted to do that involved Rextro uh, as kind of a primary component because Rextro cracks me up. He's, he's, yeah. He's such an innocent. Although sort I think of, he's funniest in, in smaller doses. Well, he's well. So, but I, what I wanted to do was take what was funny about Rextro and exaggerate it and, and make a whole world out of it and and play with that and juxtapose it with you with the ukulele. <laughs> but like drop them into a low poly world. Uh, kind, yeah, I don't like, want to. Ah, everything's so pokey. It's it's something that might might still come back in the future. It, oh, it was okay. it was a solid it was a solid story. I really liked it, but the problem was it was too specific in one direction. And then I had a couple of other ideas that would work as, um, got to be careful what I say now. It's basically, yeah. I, had a, I had a few, a few ideas that were, um, well, they just didn't work for a variety of reasons and it would have caused some conflicts. And one of the other problems with Yuka is that Yuka actually has a really specific logic to how the world works. Like, um, you mm -hmm. know, for example, if I wanted to put something in the book where the characters go into one of the tome worlds and they collect quills well then it can't be yeah. one of the other tome worlds that we've already seen because there are no quills left because the whole point of the game <laughs> is that you collect all the quills on the world and all the pages right so i can't just throw 10 more quills in because it would destroy the continuity of the world so anytime that there's anything where the characters have to collect something it's you know it, it takes place in a new era so these are the kinds of things that you have to work out and also make sure that it doesn't run into any conflicts with the studio and you know, because they, right. they, they well, were I think very... that's the real challenge of a video game story, isn't it? It's balancing what's been established in the video game world, the rules of that world, which were made for gameplay, against what the story needs to be an interesting story. Sometimes those two things don't always fit together, like Super mm -hmm. Mario Brothers mm -hmm. movie. Um, I mean, you know, like you have to, <laughs> <laughs> you have to, well, that, that's a whole other story. That movie has a crazy production history. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know, but it, it changed oh, yeah, hands yeah. a lot. I think at one point Arnold Schwarzenegger mm -hmm. was going to be Bowser or King Koopa, as well, he would that, call that back been then. Great for a different I reason. would have loved that. I'm like, I would still watch that. I mean, Illumination, take note. Well, these a little plumbers. bit of Arnold. What did, what did these plumbers do? <laughs> yes, exactly um and it just it changed so much but i feel like you have to take what's great about the game but make a great story out of that mm -hmm. i think that's where the tricky parts and adaptation lies it's not just about accuracy it's also about well is it funny on the page are the characters endearing do i care what happens in this story mm -hmm. even though i'm not playing it yeah 
Yeah. Now let me uh, let me let me jump in here and see. Uh, there's a couple of questions here. Um, oh, good. Uh, Brian says, "Man, Grant is so involved with the community. He's such a stud." Yeah. Oh, he is a stud. Yeah, I love Grant. He is a stud. What a what a what a guy. Yeah, and he and, and he, a musical genius. He is a musical genius. Yeah, I, I like <laughs> to really think about what makes Grant's music so special, and um, part of it really just comes down to the fact that I don't think I've ever forgotten a single piece of music I've heard of it. Yeah, I'm gonna say it's just so unique and memorable in each area. Like I remember exactly where I was when that music was playing to the yeah. point where you know Grunty could quiz you on it like what's yeah. this music from it was funny yeah, and I... I think it's so atmospheric you know especially when you know you go underwater and then it modulates into something that's underwater -y. it was really special yeah. at the time in particular the n64 days because he really didn't get a lot of music like that especially with the dynamic switching between areas you know you go into a cave oh yeah that was the best you would use the marimba and you go out in the, in the beach and suddenly it's this you know you do steel drums and it would it would transition <laughs> i feel like time. grant is a fan of the marimba as i was playing ukulele i was thinking <laughs> man nobody does marimba like grant kirkhope <laughs> i like his use of woodwinds he uses a lot of woodwinds like uh, there's a part in uh in Moody May's Marsh in Ukulele, where if you go into a certain area, it's like a, it, it, the music turns into like a woodwind version and it's, it's beautiful. Yeah, I like yeah. that. It kind of uh, takes me back to Bubble Gloop Swamp a little bit. Yeah, that's you right. I, I've, got a, I've got an homage to Bubble Gloop Swamp in the book, as a matter of fact. Called, it's called, called Bubble Bomb Bomb. That water, the water was so frustrating as a kid, just to have the, the floors made of hot lava kind of mm, deal where the, mm -hmm. you can't step in the water. But I loved it, though, the element of challenge. You know? <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of fun. All right, now, uh, Jonathan says, do either of you want to get into or back into full-time game design working under a company? Why not fly over, enjoy, play tonic full-time? Well, uh, I don't think they want me there, Jonathan. To be honest, <laughs> I, I, I don't know if they, I don't know if I fit their 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 team uh, structure. Uh, no, they uh, th that you know it's as far as working for a studio. I think what it's not so much that it it it, it, it can't happen or anything. It's just that it's uh, there's just been this thing to do. You know, we got to we got to yeah. finish the book and see what's next. I mean, I, I have every intention of continuing to work with them as long as they'll allow me to continue working with them. And um, because I know the, the thing about Platonic, I brought this up the other day. Uh, there, there's an enormous source of frustration for me regarding uh, Platonic's uh, perception because people don't quite understand how uh, uh, what what they accomplished. Uh, they don't understand quite how amazing what that accomplishment was. They 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 worked with what was essentially a, a, a fraction of a budget of a, yeah. A no, of, it looks great. I mean, yeah. I didn't even think that the budget was limited any time when I was playing. Oh, I mean, but the the challenge, of course, is convincing to folks because the the relative perception is well, they had a very high fundraise on uh, Kickstarter. But the problem is that game production is is cost yeah you know, twenty times that. Oh amount. yeah, it's very expensive. And and so I'm really blown away. And and as somebody who worked on a, a you know seven platform games like like that with Ratchet, I can tell you it's it blows me away what that team on average of ten people did in that amount of time as well. It's also a shorter production time oh, yeah. than most. It's just that you happen to hear well, about most it. Most game beginning. production times are short to begin with. So to go shorter than that, you know, or yeah. there's always this sense of pressure. There's always this sense that the clock is ticking. Oh my gosh. Mm. Oh my gosh. Get the assets done. Get it anyway, in. The, the reason that I bring this up is that I'm, I'm blown. I'm, I'm really standing in awe of what they accomplished. And that, what that means is when they, when they stop, when they try, if they ever try to do something that is, not a 35 hour like epic game because it took me 35 mm -hmm. hours to totally I know. it's, it's not game. as as easy as it looks when you go in <laughs> no, it's not and it takes a long time and if they I, my theory is if they try either to expand the team which they have or they try to take on a, a slightly less i don't want to say less ambitious project but you know what i mean yeah. uh, i think i don't that, mind ambitious projects not, not like so it. much not less <laughs> ambitious projects just if they try in um smaller scope it, they, yeah, just in a way, then then I think they'll they'll uh, um, they'll blow everybody away with what they can accomplish because they, they have such incredible talent there. So it would be an honor to join them. But I, to be honest, I mean, I, I'm having a blast watching from the <laughs> sidelines and being able to reflect back to them something from here because I get to I get to you know I get to play the games. I get to you know uh, share ideas with them with what I'm creating, and I don't know if that's reflecting on them as a studio. Well, I think I in many ways. I was going to say, I think in many ways, your work amplifies what they've done well in their work. They make a good character design, you make it move. You know, they make a colorful world, you paint it up beautifully. And I think it just highlights the strength of the game and, and pluses them 
as we would say in animation. Well, that's that's the goal anyway, and hopefully it's hopefully it's accomplished. Let's get through a few yeah. more. Well, actually, I'd like to answer the question too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so why don't you just join a, a studio? Um, I, I kind of my first job out of school was in games, and I was kind of ready to get out of that one just because I think the project itself wasn't my style. It was a lot of testosterone, a lot of busty mages was kind of the only female characters that existed, and it, it just wasn't something that I could relate to. But for the right project, I think I could go full time. Like I, I enjoy being in a studio. I enjoy the um, synergy and I enjoy being part of a team that's making something special. So when I see something like ukulele or cuphead, every time I see something like that come out, I'm like, yeah. oh man, I've gotten the itch. Should I go into games? No, no, I've got stuff to do. And I'm in the middle of working on an illustrated novel that's my own project. So that I do kind of have other priorities, but if Platonic called, sure. You know, for the right project, the right team, you know, if it was something that I thought was exciting that I believed in, I would kind of drop everything for a year or two and make that happen. I think it'd be very exciting. So if you're That's listening, cool. Platonic. Yeah, I'm yeah, into yeah. It. yeah. Well, they're, they're monitoring <laughs> I mean, I'm happy with what I'm doing now. Don't get me wrong. But it's always it's exciting to have a new adventure where you have a very clear goal and then you can see it go out into the world and and people can play it like that's just really cool. Right, right. Awesome. Okay, well let's uh, let's see what we got here. Uh, I think the fake part was the aliens. No, nah, that can't be right. No, that was the only real part. Yeah. Uh, no, everything uh, else he made up. There is no ukulele. It's a mass hallucination. <laughs> yes, yes, Jeff, Jeff Donnelly. I know that name. Uh, nope, the aliens part was true for sure. See, see, J Jeff knows. Jeff knows. Yeah. Jeff knows the truth. Brian <laughs> says, "I have so many questions, but I'll try to limit myself." All right. Question number one: The story of ukulele is obviously very simple. Will the graphic novel be more story oriented or, or more simple like the game? Furthermore, do I need to have finished the game first? Uh, the, last, the last question is, well, it, it won't hurt to have finished the game, but I, don't, I, I think you can enjoy the book without it. Um, it, it's, it was written in such a way that it will be, we'll put it this way. You don't have to finish the game, but for people who did and saw the whole game, there, mm -hmm. there are so many callbacks to it that you'll really and you get a lot more yeah. enjoyment out of it for those reasons but you can enjoy it i did want to write it so that people who don't play video games can enjoy the story that was a goal from the beginning because i don't i don't want it to be just limited to fans of the game because another another well frankly, well, some people might come in through stumbling across this you know well, that's the thing i want to bring more people into the platonic universe as well who this is another it's a fun point universe people. It is, Funny. it is. And so I want it to be, I want it to be enjoyable and accessible for people to find their way into the game and, and have as much fun as I did playing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you think? And, <laughs> oh, I think, I think absolutely. I think it should be accessible to people who haven't necessarily played it. I think there's enough inherent charm in the characters that you could pick it up and be like, ha this is fun. Look at that sassy bat being sassy, you know, <laughs> yeah. they're on an adventure. Right, right. Like it's kind of like Ducktales, right? Like you could watch Ducktales and enjoy that. You could read the comics and enjoy that as well, or you could do both. You know. That's right. That's and I right. feel like and... if you like the one, you're more likely to do the other. You know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Although the Ducktales game was quite challenging, if you're talking about the yeah. Original. Well, was that it... was the era of just tough games. That early '90s mm -hmm. era. You I know, I remember they... my dad and I taking two weeks to beat a cheap cheap level in the original mario brothers just we rage quit so many times and my mom's like why don't you just not and we're like no because we, we're gonna beat it yeah you know? yeah it's it's really it gives you that that pit of your stomach sensation if you don't you can't just give up i take it. personal offense i mean once my pride gets involved it's just that's it that's where i'm gonna be until i'm until i beat it yeah yeah i remember yeah. back when i was like 10, 12, uh, we were playing Diddy Kong Racing as a family. We were playing through the entire thing, four player with my dad, brother, sister, me. And um, one night we get up at like 2 a.m., 3 a.m. And dad's still like intensely playing, trying to beat this boss guy. We're like, dad, have you been playing Diddy Kong Racing all this time? And he's like, I'm going to beat this dinosaur. And I think I inherited a little bit of that stubbornness. Well, the bosses in that were really tough. They were hard. And he was playing the advanced version of the dinosaur boss. It was like the second round where he goes even faster and mm -hmm. you really have to hit every turn just right to get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very frustrating. Had, no, I mastered. <laughs> I mastered that game. In fact, I had just That's a good game. 
I was just talking about that today. In fact, that I, there are a couple of courses I memorized to the point where those I could, time trials, man, there was, there, I, I was able to play the courses in the beginning of the game to be fair, but I could play them without looking yeah. at the screen. Yeah, that's about right. No, I had every turn. I had my favorite paths. I always played as Pipsy. I always prefer the lighter, more nimble characters when it comes to a card game. Tipped up all the yeah, way. Yeah, tipped up pretty good too. But I was also like, oh, but Pipsy has a big red bow. You know. <laughs> but tipped up's in purple. It's just it's it's, it's perfect. Tip it? I don't know. He controlled pretty well in the the water. Um, what do you call him? The hovercrafts. I uh -huh. felt like his weight was an asset there, whereas Pipsy was just like sliding all over the place. But in the carts, I like. But the Pipsy. But tipped up. The reason the play is tipped up was other than the fact that he was the best. Clearly. Was that when you used a speed I will fight boost? You. Yeah, well, I, I don't know. Diddy Kong Racing is the only one you might not want to. I, I'll lose oh, it every okay, other game. Okay. But Diddy Kong Racing, I don't know. No, but, I didn't know, mean a game fight. I meant like I'll punch you. Oh, well, you'll, you'll <laughs> still probably the win. screen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Careful, you know, like that's, a, that's new technology they have. I can you can actually punch through mm -hmm. other people's screens now. Yeah. Uh, if Platonics used it on me a few times when I asked them too many questions. <laughs> the backhand. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's 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 my way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but you know, when you, when you get a speed boost, the character's animation, their head would shoot backward. Yeah, I love like, that. Right back, and Tip Top's head flying backwards was one of the funniest things. <laughs> that was so cute. It was so cute. Okay, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. He had cute animation. He had cute <laughs> animation. Now, now, as a continuation question, and I'll, uh, I'll give you this one first, because I, I got to do some thinking on it, so I, I'm going to give you the challenge. <laughs> oh, so throw it to me first. Okay. That's right. I'm warning you ahead of time here. So, so Brian says... <laughs> Uh, what is both of your dream properties to work with? Ooh. Um, oh, gosh. Okay. Uh, Mario. Just anything related to Mario, especially Princess Peach. She was always the one where if there was an option to be Princess Peach ever, that's what I would pick. And people say they can't relate to her, but I really relate to her. And I'm just like, I, I, that is kind of my... Like, if I was shrunk down to the simplicity of a Mario character, I would be Princess Peach. You know, uh, so if there was some kind of Mario spinoff that was about the girls, like Princess Peach and Rosalina go on adventures together, I would die. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Or just anything with Mario. I just I love Mario so very much. I mean, that's kind of a obvious answer. Uh, as far as indie games go, uh, Cuphead would be amazing. I love the animation. I love the care they put into that. The designs are so charming. I love the Fleischer era of animation. It was such an era of innovation and it's so classically cartoony. That'd be amazing. Or uh, my, my video game crush right now, Stardew Valley. I have spent so many hours pretending to farm and fall in love with this entire town. And I would love to bring those characters to life more, you know, and put you in that world. Nice, so, nice. Yeah, three, an three answers. Good, good choices, good choices. Yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah, yeah. All right, let's see. Uh, dream properties for me. Uh, I've got some strange ones actually, but but I do mm -hmm. have some. Uh, let me let me get started with the recognizable ones. I think probably Pong. the Pong, well, Pong, really character course, based. Of course, I thought yeah. Pong was a given. I wouldn't even mention it. Yeah, you know, a gritty reboot. Gritty, a gritty, yeah, kind of yeah. two thousand six era brown. Everything's brown and gray. Oh, it's about the duality of man. Yes, yes, yeah. the up and the down, the up mm -hmm. and the down. The yin yes. and the yang, the light side and the dark side. Yes. It, yeah. I, I, I will never write anything better than that. I mean, <laughs> mm -hmm. that's it. So, yeah, let's see. Besides Pawn, uh, I, I would have to say uh, probably at the very top of the list, I say at the top of the list, not just because it's most one of the most desired, but because it would be easily the hardest to get, it would probably be Earthbound. Yeah. That'd, that'd kind of be, that'd be cool. Uh, I really think I'd have a lot of fun with Earthbound. The funny thing about Earthbound is that it's, it, <laughs> I didn't play it when I was younger. I don't have the, uh, the nostalgia for it as a lot of people do. Uh, and I, I hear this from a lot of folks who, who've, who've discovered Earthbound within the past five years or so. And when I played it recently, I realized what a uh, crazy surreal masterpiece it is. I so, think surreal is the word that comes to mind when I think of Earthbound. Yeah, it's a it it is a, a crazy game, but it's also really really cool, and I think it would make for an amazing book. Uh, so Earthbound, yeah. I would say, is one. Um, in terms of uh, so I'm talking I'm talking game properties here. Uh, so I, I you said Mario, I actually was was thinking a lot about Mario. I did I did a little bit of a yeah. test uh, animation a little while back. Yeah, it I was thought, really cute. I, I, I honestly the funny thing about you saying Princess Peach is I think actually I would want to work with Rosalina. 
I wanted to oh, I love Rosalina. Story. I mean, I think personally, as just as an individual, I relate to Princess Peach more. But I think Rosalina has a more interesting design and a more interesting backstory. That's what I was kind of thinking, like, let them team up. Be like Thelma and Louise. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, they, they have, a, well, just in terms of their design, they're kind of like mirror versions of each other. Yeah, I think it, it could be fun to play with that. Rosalina is kind of like a looking glass version of, of, uh, of Princess Peach in a way. I love the archetype of the star child, the kind of magical, ethereal girl who's serene and a little bit mysterious. She's like the Galadriel of Mario, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got a character like that in, in Dreamside. Is the the sort of I, I mm -hmm. literally call her the, the Dream Girl, although she's originally called Dream Child, um, but I changed that name for a variety of reasons. It was a callback to Alice in Wonderland. I was going to say it reminds me of um, the never ending story with the childlike empress. Yeah, well, that the kind uh, of well, th ethereal, a, pure child sorceress. A tremendous type. amount of never ending story influence in Dreamside. Tons. Yeah, it's, I, I used to call it, it's like never ending story with plus a medical theme. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it's ER meets never ending story. That's right. And then a natural I'll, mix. I'll throw off a few. So here's a really obscure one uh, that not a lot of people know of, uh, but uh, Goemon which is a, uh, a, it's a very oh, popular yeah. Japanese adventure game. It's sort of a, it's like a, it's an Edo era comedy. <laughs> it's sort of like a, uh, it's hard to even describe it. It's a very, it's a very much like Zelda. If, if you mix kind of Zelda and Mario and you put it in the Edo era uh, and it's extremely wacky, it's very crazy. It's got a lot of insane characters, but there was a character in that uh, named Sasuke is this little ninja character with the spiky hair, ball on the top of his head <laughs> wait it's an anime character with spiky hair i know the one. Oh, oh big guy really? are there more uh, no i don't think so just that guy oh just, yeah yeah i thought it was pretty unique but but this one actually is quite unique because it's, it's, it's just his shape he's like a little doll uh and um uh, so i just love that character so much i, re I remember reading a, a nintendo power magazine remember nintendo power magazine? oh yeah my mm -hmm. brother got it. I was always like, I don't want a guide. I don't need a guide. I'm going to beat it all by myself and no one tell me anything. Oh, I didn't get it for I the guide. guide I, I got it for the little JPEG, is, uh, highly condensed images, so I could dream of having whatever this wonderful game was. And uh, I remember them showing yeah, an I image did, like, from the, uh, Goemon the at games. one point. So yeah, yeah, Goemon is actually on the list. And then I've, I've, got, a, um, I've got a lot. I've actually got a few that I, I have been talking with. But I, I don't want to reveal what those are. Are you allowed just, to say? No. I feel like it's a little early to say, right? It's a little early to say. There's some that I've pursued and, and they, they're promising, but you know, it, this exciting. is this is one of yeah. This is one of the things about this this campaign that drives me insane is I, I would love to be able to come out and say, Oh, I'm gonna work on these like four books. Uh, yeah. but I can't. So you know, I've, I've got to get kind of this one going. And, uh, and who knows where we'll go from here. But then, Well, I think that's kind of what we should talk about, too, is what happens if this gets funded, why you and I are talking, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. Should we, should we go into that? We could. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, really, the, uh, I, I would say that one last one would be, uh, 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 would be uh, uh, and actually is probably the, the most likely of all of these, I think, just because of my current relationship, is actually to, to uh, stick with Platonic. I, I've told them a, a lot of times I'd love to do a book with the Shell character, uh, who is sort of a Jet Force Gemini inspired character in the uh, the Galleon Galaxy world? And she she yeah. uh, and part of this is this is kind of a um, there's a two part reason for this. One is I just think it would just be an awesome book, but also I've already kind of been making my own similar character when I I had, oh really uh, yeah when I got to that part of the level and then they started to kind of merge in my mind, and so I was able to take kind of what I loved about my character and what they were doing, and it just sort of uh it, it just merged together and it kind of became like an obvious thing but then again mm -hmm. again you never know what a studio is going to do with something and they're notoriously secretive uh, uh, about what they're what they're doing so i i don't know if they'll ever pursue anything with her ever again uh yeah. which is one of the reasons i pitched a book <laughs> so we'll see <laughs> mm -hmm. uh so yeah let me let me we got a few more questions here so let's let's get okay. through these now uh mia's page uk says hi hello hello and uh Brian says, oh, just for the record, uh, he has finished it. He was just curious if it was integral to the story. So, yes. Oh, sure. Uh, Jonathan says, Casey, you talk so enthusiastically about video games. So it's a shame you had a bad experience with the industry regarding gender equality and representation. Well, it's not an industry-wide problem. I wouldn't say it's specific to the entire video game industry. It just happens that the studio I was at had a very um, 
backwards view of women. It, it, they were very much objects and trophies and all the things that people complain about when they complain about gender issues in video games were very much present there. Um, and across the board, I felt like there was just kind of a lack of care. There was a lack of artistry. When I work on something, I want to work on it with my whole heart. Um, and I want to really get into it and relate to it and think it's just so worthwhile that it's worth spending years of my life on. So there are video games like that. I mean, like, I thought Breath of the Wild was beautiful and had like, and Zelda was very cool in that. And I feel like uh, the representation in like Stardew Valley is pretty equal. Although I feel like the girls are actually like more desirable marriage candidates in Stardew Valley than the guys. They're just like, all around better people yeah, I, but I have to that's agree with you. <laughs> yeah like i'm just like i married elliot but then leah came around and was like hey do you want to like drink cider and snuggle under a big quilt and i'm like oh man i'm married but you know if you had asked me that a month ago sure you know now, if um, doesn't know anything about stardew valley that's i'm sorry i'm such a nerd for it <laughs> Yeah, one of the great things in Stardew Valley is you can get married and you can marry either gender regardless of what your gender is. Although I'm kind of thinking it might be fun to start a farm where I'm like a big, strong lumberjack because that's something I'm not in real life, you know. Um, but no, I think I don't think it's um, that all video games don't see women well. It was just this particular studio. We didn't share a lot of values. Um, and I just kind of got tired of painting things that I didn't relate to. And I felt like I was kind of lying every time I was painting. And I want to feel like I'm telling the truth when I'm making art. Like I can really believe in these characters and, and mm -hmm. share with you how cool they are. Like if I was working on ukulele, I'd be like, oh my God, you guys are so fun. Uh, look at like how charming they are. Look at, don't you want to just like pat Yuka's little head? Cause like I do, you know? <laughs> and, and then like <laughs> capital B, I just want to go boop, 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 boop. You know, it'd make a, he'd get a good sound. I think if Grant Kirkhope could play like marimba on Yuka's head, it'd be a very interesting sound. It, it, it would be the marimba, <laughs> wouldn't it? Or is I yeah. Oh my gosh, of course it would be. I feel like uh, Laylee would be somewhere, either like a slide whistle or just a kazoo. Like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Depending. <laughs> like, yeah, I feel she... like if Yuka, if Yuka took a fall, Laylee was like, meow, <laughs> you know. Oh, you could take a she, ton of falls would... in the book. Yeah. That's, oh, that's, yeah. One of the, that's one of the most fun parts to draw is that when Yuka falls, Laylee uh, is always forgetting to join him for the yeah. fall. So she has to rush. Right. It's like, um, excuse me, my partner who can fly. Do you want to help me out here? <laughs> yeah, they have a few of those jokes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, like, yeah sure. As soon, as soon as I get these pages or quills or whatever I'm getting, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's interesting about that, that when you say about uh, being able to care a lot about the character. And that's something yeah. that, that is kind of a universal concept. You have to be able to, uh, if you don't really like what you're working on for whatever reason, it's really hard to make it good. Oh yeah, it shows. And I think it takes a toll on the artist. I think it, it results in an inferior product. So I try to really work on characters that I'm passionate about and love. And I feel like Platonic puts out so many charming, funny, likable characters that I'm, I'm way into what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Well, good question. Let's move on. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, Jonathan says, thankfully, I think the industry and world in general has begun to make changes in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And he, and he says, maybe I'm pushing my own dreams onto you. But I would say <laughs> give games design another shot because uh, especially as you could be at the very forefront of this important societal change. Uh, so uh, my question to you is, how will you bring your pe your Princess Peach love into the in back into games, Casey? How do we get you into games? Um, well, I if you're asking how to get me into games, it's really just a matter of make me a job offer. Well, I, I'm amplifying <laughs> Jonathan's concern, so... Oh, well, okay. Um, I think just as in writing, just write interesting characters with interesting scenarios and, and charming designs who have their own personalities. And I, I know Princess Peach is a very girly girl archetype, but I enjoy her simplicity and her sweetness. I think it's a nice foil to Mario's simplicity. He's a very much an everyman, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't think it's a matter of having to convince me to come back to games. It's just that my career has taken a turn towards books, which I'm also very nerdy and passionate about. I've been geeking out about games here, but like, don't even get me started on books, you know? <laughs> so it's really, it's a matter of at this point in my life, the opportunities that have come my way, the gates that are open to me, where I already have a bit of traction is more in the realm of books. 
but I'm absolutely interested in games. Every once in a while, I think of just packing up everything and being like, hey, guys who made Cuphead, I want in. Like, let me in. I'll draw stuff for you, you know? <laughs> or, I mean, I feel that, I honestly, I, I mentioned this to my mom when Ukulele came out. I'm like, geez, man, seeing this charming animation just kind of makes me want to go back to games. But uh, but I've already gone halfway down this road towards books. And, I've you know, I took a detour in animation and now I'm working on fashion design. So I don't consider myself to be um, just a designer of one kind of thing. It's just that at right now my career is is more about illustration. But I'm totally open to working in games. And part of what attracted me to uh, support David with this project is the idea of engaging with games through books and marrying art and storytelling and charming you know expressions that you would use in animation in service of a game story and saying hey games can be just as vibrant and wonderful and world building as movies and why not engage with them via a graphic novel as you might with a film property you know mm -hmm. uh, awesome yeah okay uh and so uh brian says awesome i got a bounce but well, don't bounce too high. But great job! Yeah. I just pledged via Heroes Armory on Kickstarter. Well, thank you very thank much. Thank you, I'm, Brian, and I, thanks for the good questions too. Yeah. Very interesting. I, I I'm not I'm not sure what Heroes Armory is. What is Heroes Armory? Is that a Kickstarter project? I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I got to find out what that means. Uh, it sounds heroic. It's, it's, yes, and and uh, and armored. <laughs> yes, I, yes. I got to I got to check it out. Uh, let's see. All right. Uh, Margaret Argentine says, way above my can. Now, what is can? Way above my can. And there's a smiley face, a very... Ken, K-I-N? K-E-N. Ken, K-E-N. I assume she's not talking about Ken from Street Fighter. I, I'm thinking of Ken from Barbie, um, again. Oh, Ken from Barbie. That girly, would make more girly sense. Girly girl. I don't know. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yes. is that what she means? Is it capital K? I don't know no, what this Lowercase can, but I think that's, I have a feeling that's what she meant. <laughs> yeah. If you're out there, elaborate, because I'm not sure. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Now, uh, uh, Jeff Donnelly. Now, I, I should should mention that Jeff is a good friend of mine. And so it's nice to see oh, him here. Hi, this, whole, this whole live stream is like a big flashback. <laughs> and it'd be awesome to see you do Goemon. Now, the first time I, <sighs> I, I experienced Goemon, in fact, was with Jeff. And uh, uh, it was uh, it was back on the Super Nintendo. Was, I think it was the only game oh, yeah. to make it here. I was for busy the... playing Donkey Kong Country. That was almost exclusively <laughs> what I played on, well, we, on we had, SNES. <laughs> we had we had finished that, and we're we're, we're looking for our next challenge. Uh, yes, and uh, uh, Tony Mora. Uh, I also know Tony Mora. Now Tony Mora was a a, a coworker of mine at Insomniac Games. So, well, oh, fun. Tony. Thanks for coming. Hello. Uh, and studio, he says, Studio MDHR. I don't know what that is. Just posted they are looking for an illustrator. Just oh. saying. Oh, that's the Cuphead guys. Uh, oh, I might apply for that. <laughs> hey, oh, you, you want to uh, link in the comments or just send me a link at hello at CaseyRobin.com? I'm interested. Yeah. Hey, now this could be a very productive hangout if that worked out. Yeah, no, that would be really fun. I love, I love animation history and I love how much they love it. And I think I could definitely be an asset. So yeah, send well, me that. Thank well, you. That's, well, that's fantastic. I, I'm very happy that that's happened. So yeah, let's <laughs> now, now see, now you have to make it happen because everyone's going to want to see that. Okay, come guys. To fruition. It, no, when you're when you're a professional, like the one of the things that you have to realize is everything you try your best, you put it out there, and then you just let fate take its course. You know, sometimes you knock twice or three times, but so many times um, I'm less like, oh, I'm totally gonna get this exact job, and I get like the one next to that, and it ends up being a good thing. So, I mean, I try to steer my career, but it's a bit of a a wild ride. Mm -hmm. it's okay though mm -hmm. i've had a lot of yeah. fun you well, know some, like... sometimes you just have to bust the door down just keep going <laughs> sometimes yes but i feel like this one will be more like hey is this what you're looking for and then we see yes yes well it sounds yeah. like i mean with with the amount of passion you have for the game i think you should go for mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so that, that, that's just great <laughs> it, the, the stream comes full circle that that's amazing uh, yeah. um, and uh yes uh, uh, uh maggie explained things being my ken from the sound of music Oh yeah, yes. yeah. I'm 16, going on 17. It's been a long time. 
<laughs> right, right. I thought I always thought that was K-I-N, like she didn't know things beyond her family. Mm -hmm. Like she was young and naive and had never ventured out from the, the nuclear family. Right. I mm -hmm. don't know. Yeah. I could be wrong on that. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. But this is the same girl where I used to think that in the Gaston song that they were talking about like a swell cleft. I didn't know that it was swell cleft. I was just like, what's a swell cleft? Well, I don't know. It must be that thing in his chin. I, I can so never. So I have been known to mishear lyrics. I, I can never understand lyrics. I, I've always been terrible with lyrics and songs. I hear a jumble of words and make up something weird. Yeah. Or like in the, the national anthem, I'm like, or, or America the Beautiful. I'm like, oh man, the sky, it's really for spacious today. It's beautiful. Beautiful mm -hmm. for spacious sky. Mm -hmm. You know? And I'm like, oh, once again, for spacious two words not one yeah but i just accepted it as yeah. like oh that must be an outdated word we don't use anymore mm. that means like i don't know blue or something yeah i had a friend who thought a great uh, with a grain of salt was a great assault a grain of salt that's different yeah 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 interesting <laughs> oh mishearing lyrics yeah, that's right now can you talk about any personal things that you're doing sure um yeah so I am working on an illustrated novel, hopefully trilogy, uh, retelling the myth of Medusa from her point of view. And it's very much about uh, what is the nature of beauty and who gets to decide that and, and what does that mean for each individual. And it's very much about Medusa finding her courage and finding her confidence. Um, and it's, it's kind of a flipped story. So the villain is the goddess who curses her, who gives her this horrible form. And uh, my Medusa is, is terrified of snakes. They're just <laughs> the worst. And she's a sculptress. She works in stone before the curse hits. So the curse is sort of an inversion of, um, it, it's meant to be like a personally tailored punishment. Um, so that's been fun. Uh, I'm working with my agent on that. I have book one written and we have some interest at uh, a few different major publishers. I'm really excited. So it's, it's such a long road. Uh, don't look for it for at least two, three years if everything goes perfectly. Um, you know, uh, cause it's a full novel with illustrations. It's sort of like, um, Armand Baltasar is timeless in that regard where it's like mm. prose with illustrations for middle grade readership. Um, so that's really exciting, but it's very long term. Uh, I'm also working with Pinup Girl on some new dress designs, and mm. I'm not allowed to say much more than that, but it's very exciting. And you may see some innovative new Casey Robin-esque dresses coming out. Uh, and then my brother and I have continued our work on the line we call Tea and Strumpets, which is our teas with cute girls on the tins. And we're working on a Sakura Jasmine for this coming spring, like a cherry blossom inspired jasmine so i get to design that which is really fun that's uh, awesome yeah and then yeah. i'm working on a few picture books with friends and uh an illustrated uh illustrated novel kind of thing or graphic novel with another friend so mm -hmm. yeah now not now, allowed to say much on those yet <laughs> right right now 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 we met at comic-con just this yeah. past year and it was I funny walked by and i'm like Ooh, it's like Lisa Frank. I like Lisa Frank. Let's talk to this guy. Ukulele. No, no, but wait, but I'm wait, on board. But you forgot. You forgot the important. The important word there. It was. It was. It was classy Lisa Frank, right? Oh yeah, it was classy Lisa Frank. It was like high end Lisa Frank. I love Lisa Frank. <laughs> it, was, it was Lisa. Like... Frank. It was. You know what it, it actually is? It's Lisa Frank plus red, because mm -hmm. I don't know if people know this about Lisa Frank, but she doesn't use red. She uses. Yeah, she, she always uses red like a, a fuchsia. Or a, yeah, magenta. Fuchsia, yeah, yeah, like a magenta color, right? And uh, uh, avoids that red, and that's part. That's a. It's a weird dynamic because it, it really throws mm -hmm. off the spectrum. Uh, yeah. And it well, it, it is. It makes everything feel otherworldly. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And like, an, and my Casey Robin palette is like a Rococo palette plus red. It's like a '50s take on a Rococo palette. What's so a Rococo like Robin's palette? Like, oh, uh, think of the color. And call me and it came through on my oh can you hear me sorry uh someone was trying to call me just now um so think like marie antoinette powder blue france in the 1750s that's rococo you know mm. that picture of the girl in the swing and that floofy peach dress that's okay. kind of a rococo era thing um so i i brought it into kind of a mid-century modern place and added red 
Oh, neat. Okay. Now, yeah. <laughs> but I still don't know what the, where, where is the, why is it called Rococo? What's the, what, what is the word? That is what art historians decided to call it. That's as far as I know. Oh, okay. It's like, you know, you have Renaissance, you have like an Edwardian period, you have the Rococo era. And it's not just art that's called that. It's the fashion of the day. You know, you think of the Marie Antoinette silhouette. It's like the big poofy wigs. That's Rococo. You have mm. Rococo furniture. It's referenced in Beauty and the Beast when um, Cogsworth is giving his boring art history lecture. <laughs> the Rococo. <laughs> right, right. And no, the I... Rococo, of course, led into the Baroque period. And as I always say, if it's not Baroque, don't fix it. <laughs> uh, very good. Yes. I straight up stole that from Beauty and the Beast. That's <laughs> that Baroque. Doesn't I, I like. can't take credit, but I love how cheesy that is. Yeah, but I, but I'm, I grew I'm, up. I'm, on, I grew up on Adam West Batman, y'all. So I, I I like some cheesy humor. I like I like a lot of dancing in my shows. My superhero <laughs> shows. They don't. They're not yeah, dancing it, in superheroes. Only if it's a superhero show. Otherwise, it's too silly. Yeah, <laughs> you know what would be fun is like a Star Trek, like a Star Trek: The Next Generation sort of oh, show. Oh, I want. Just, but they break out and dance. I that want a crossover awesome. where Adam West Batman meets Captain Picard, and they have a dance off. <laughs> Someone make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Actually, no, yeah. not Captain Picard. I'm sorry, Captain Kirk. Captain Picard is the one. Actually, I would love to see him dance, but I mm -hmm. think Captain Kirk would have a fun time dancing with. 60s Batman, whereas Captain Picard would be like, why am I doing this? Well, sure, I need to because, seriously re-evaluate my, my life decision. Because Captain Kirk has that kind of shooty way of moving. Oh, yeah. Well, Captain Kirk, yeah. 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 With Picard, yeah. I'm like, I genuinely admire Captain Picard. Like, I would follow him anywhere. Yes, get off my bridge. <laughs> Shut up, Wesley. Yeah. Number one, get off my bridge. <laughs> oh, I love that show so much. Yeah, yeah. It's coming back, right? He's coming back. I know. Back. Yeah, that's pretty neat. What's well, so? Uh, what was the name of the fashion again? Sorry, very dense. Rok Rococo. Roco so there's Rococo, and um, uh, it, this reminds me of um, the the. Have you ever are you familiar with the crinoline fashion of the Victorian era England? Oh, I wear the crinoline fashion of Victoria era England every what? year at Dick at Dickens Fair. I got my Victorian dress in the closet over here. This is funny. Now you know. You know. Obviously, you know. Uh, now Casey sent me something wonderful for my birthday. Some art prints that she had drawn from. From Alice. Now, I, yeah. I'm, I'm a because we're both Alice in Wonderland fans, but he takes the cake. Well, I take the cake because uh, I've, I've reached obsessive levels. Like I, I'm part of the Lewis Carroll Society of, of the U.S. and the U.K. <laughs> uh, although, actually, I don't think I've paid my dues to the U.K. in a while. They're, I think they're coming after me. But, oh yeah, they're going to send uh, men after you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I consider myself. I, I think I could almost consider myself a historian of Lewis Carroll. Uh, but uh, the crinoline fashion, interesting thing, just talking about mm -hmm. these, these kind of very old fashion styles, uh, was, you know, John Tenniel, the illustration, the illustrator mm -hmm. for uh, Alice. The original had, Alice in Wonderland illustrator. That's right. He Good stuff. He drawn through, and through the looking glass, which actually is the book I prefer, by the way. Um, yeah, I, I do too. Yeah. And he had, he had drawn Alice with in a dress. It was a, it was a crinoline uh, kind of with the rolls. Right, mm -hmm. like yeah. lots of ruffles, lots of ruffles underneath the underneath the skirt to give the skirt volume. Right, and uh, he ended. I, Lewis Carroll, for whatever reason, told him, "I hate crinoline fashion." <laughs> <Absolutely hate it. laughs> well, that's too bad because this is going to make it iconic. Yeah, well, that's the thing, and then he ended up having <laughs> and then Disney's going to come along and cement that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, he ended up changing the illustrations to accommodate the uh, Lewis Carroll's request. But I always found that kind of interesting how somebody can have such a <laughs> Uh, like a, a visceral reaction oh, yeah. to uh, a particular style. So I'm trying to think if I feel that way about any particular style. It would be jagging. What is the swain sort of like the when you talk about like the swain dress kind of thing? I'm thinking of uh, uh, Bougereau, the artist. Hmm. Yeah. You know the very dreamy um, um, French. Uh, uh, he almost did these uh, like fantastical paintings are really well done i think it was bougereau yeah no he's good um i i think of the pinup artists of the 50s when i think of really good swing dress art i think of like gil elvgren you know, know he was able to get oh you've probably seen his work he does really cute smiley rosy cheeked 50s ladies with pretty curls and mm -hmm. and uh, the skirts are usually flaring up in such a way that you can see quite a lot of leg you know, sometimes a little bit more because they were meant to be pinups. Those um, were those but, were exaggerated to you. Had it was like ninety percent leg. It, it went oh, just yeah, like it no, went, those leg, proportions went like, are 
They're basically kind of the barbification proportions where you just make the legs longer. It's just I, mean, I think that's hips, neck, head. Yeah, but I think that's kind of just a fashion figure. That's just fashion figures tend to have long yeah. legs. That's yeah. why Sailor Moon has such long legs because the yeah. designer was working in fashion first and brought in that fashion design aesthetic of the super long legs. Right, right. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and I, I want to know how much Clamp was inspired by the Sailor Moon. Because uh, oh, I'm, I don't I'm a know. huge, I'm a you know, you know of Clamp, right? The the manga team. Not not really. You, you Sorry. Some of their stuff. They they they've done like Magic Knight Ray Earth. Um, they did uh, uh, Card Captor. Card Captor. Oh, Sakura. okay. I know Card Captor Sakura. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, lots of stuff. They, they, um, what's For magical it? girl <laughs> stuff, I like Madoka Magica. That one mm. was surprising. Mm -hmm. I thought it was going to be cute girls fighting cute outfits. And it was kind of, but it also made me cry. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was like Pixar, you go in like, oh, up, old man in a bunch of balloons. This will be so whimsical. And I'm crying, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, right. I, you know, I haven't seen all of it. I, in fact, I, I haven't seen much of that at all. You haven't seen Madoka Magica? Well, go well, watch it. I've seen, I'm confused <laughs> about the, yeah. I'm confused about the magical, uh, uh, the kind of magic girl, genre because i understand that there was was one project that was the first one that was like a it was almost like a student project or something that that kind of seemed to kind of kick off that phenomenon and then there were a few projects well i always think of sailor moon being the thing that made that made the magical girl into a phenomenon it might mm. have been around before sailor moon but sailor moon took it to america made it global and made it stick yeah, Sailor Sailor Moon was brilliant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, uh, and I was I didn't even know it existed when I was a kid. I would have really liked it. I would have probably not been allowed to watch it because my parents really? didn't let me watch a lot of stuff. Like I couldn't oh, right. watch Captain Planet, Clarissa Explains It All, but I could watch like Aliens and Terminator <laughs> when my dad when my dad was home. It was like whether it was dad or mom determined that's, a lot. <laughs> that's so specific. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, I don't want you watching Captain Planet. Yeah, oh, my I, mom thought it was leftist propaganda. And oh. I'm like, what's the worst that could happen? I start recycling more? I mean, it was a, it was a pretty innocent show. And it had. And it, was, it wasn't even that. It wasn't even a very good show. I didn't even really want to watch it. I only wanted to watch it because it was forbidden. Oh, yeah. That was the yeah. only well, draw. That, that and Captain like, Planet was pretty dreamy. Oh, I mean, that he had that mullet, the, though. He had that the, green mullet. So, mm -hmm. come on. I, I, you don't like no, that? I was crushing on Fox Mulder. Okay, X Files, early X Files with the floppy '90s hair. Oh, that was my no, '90s crush. No, I can never, 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 never understand I anything. Say I like the way he talked. I said I like the way he looked. <laughs> <laughs> uh, early '90s. We're we're getting into Twin Peaks territory, which is something that we yeah. only recently discovered. You know, I'm I have not... never watched Twin Peaks. You you have not yet seen it. Yeah, you. I grew you up in the Twilight it. Zone. Does that count for anything? It, well, it counts That's for the Twilight weird. Zone. <laughs> Yeah, I know, but it's kind of weird. Like Twin Peaks is weird, right? I haven't watched it, so I don't know what I'm talking about. It's, it is a weird show, but it's 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 uh, it, what's surreal. It's very surreal. Um, uh, it, it's it, what I didn't know about David Lynch, the director, uh, was that how much he had apparently inspired the Silent Hill series, which is one of my favorite. Oh games. yeah. No, I I was a Nintendo girl all the way, so I never played anything PlayStation. I had like a Sega Game Gear for like a year. And apart mm -hmm. from that, it was 100% Nintendo. So mm -hmm. there's so much I didn't play. I did see the movie, but I understand it's not a very good representation of the games. And it wasn't mm -hmm. also a very good movie. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, <laughs> uh, J Jonathan says, I'm fortunate enough to currently be living in Oxford, England. Well, how do you like that? That's where Ooh, Lewis Carroll Fancy. <laughs> where Lewis Carroll got, oh, well, there we are. <laughs> Should yeah. continue reading before I answer. Uh, where Lewis Carroll got much of his inspiration for the Alice story. There's a lot of Alice in Wonderland history around here. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's amazing. That must be really neat to live there. Oh, I would love to go to Oxford. I've been to England, but I didn't have time to go to Oxford. I was just kind of in London for like two days, run around, do some things. The old Tate, much better than the new Tate, in my opinion. Of course, I'm a fan of Pre-Raphaelite art, so that made a big difference for me. I like art that looks like stuff. Mm, yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, I want I want to get back to meeting at Comic Con now. Uh, so yeah, I, I was set up at my tiny little table with the uh, the publisher, my my wonderful publisher friend, who I, I think is the 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 nicest man in publishing, Mr. Stephen Robson. I don't know if you had a chance to talk to him, but oh Stephen, yeah, I did. He's very nice. Stephen is is my my English partner uh, who's handling. I was going to say, and he has a cool accent. 
Oh, he. Well, he gets all the way down here, darling. Yeah, <laughs> if he's spent more than an hour talking. So yeah, that, it's it's, uh, it's fun to talk to him and get him to that that gravelly voice. But he he um he's he's my distribution partner in the UK. So we're handling uh, distribution of books for the rest of the, the what I call the rest of the world, anything but US and Canada, and uh, UK, EU, uh, and rest of the world. We had to work on all this crazy shipping stuff. And Stephen came through as my savior because uh, Stephen does a lot of warehousing for bigger publishers, mm-hmm. and uh, particularly Titan, which is ironic because Titan was was the publisher I was suggested to approach about this. Book. Yeah, they're and kind said, of a titan of the industry. They are, they are, and they put out a lot of great content. Um, and Stephen was actually uh, Titan, one of Titan's first uh, publishers, I believe, back in the eighties. And then he he left Titan and he formed his own publishing company. And I just love the guy because he's, I found Steven through. Well, he's passionate about books. You know, he's passionate about making excellent works of art. And I appreciate that. Oh yeah. But well, I found one of his books in a, in a local library. It was in the manga section because he does a lot of manga localization Mm -hmm. for, for the, uh, for England. And he has a Spanish partner and uh, he, he localized a, a manga artist named Jiro Taniguchi who is a famous in Japan, but is hardly known outside. And uh, he does these uh, incredible books. They're really, really rich stories. And the art is just to die for. It's amazing. He has this book I have up here on my shelf called A Zoo in Winter, which mm. is, you got to read that book. That's okay. it's about becoming a manga artist. I like artist. good manga. It's about becoming a manga artist in the 60s mm. uh, in, in, in Japan. And it's 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 unbelievable. Like, a guy wants, he, he ends up working in a textile factory and he ends up going into under a, uh, like an apprenticeship under the manga. Yeah. Uh, what, it, it's beyond amazing to read. Apparently when Miyazaki was younger, he wanted to be a manga artist and at a certain point decided he wasn't good enough and that the best he could do was get a job at an animation studio. And it's so crazy for me to think of Miyazaki like at 20 or 25 being like, oh man, my career is over. I suck. I'll just take this animation job, I guess. Yeah, you know? yeah. and you know, he doesn't, he's never changed. He's the same way now. Yeah, I, I love Miyazaki. Him. I watched an interview with him. I mean, he's, he's got to be like 80, 85 at this mm-hmm. point, right? Maybe almost 80. Yeah, no, anyway. for me, he's such a picture of success. Someone who's able to be working into their the later part of their life and is yeah. able to be totally true to themselves and passionate about what they do. Like that's the dream. But the tragedy right? of Miyazaki is that if you listen to him talk, he, I, I heard him say, I heard him say, I don't remember. It wasn't these exact words. And of course it may have been translated awkwardly as well, but he basically said, I've wasted my life. Oh, he hasn't. What is he? Yeah. Why would he think that? Yeah. He said, <laughs> Oh, I, 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 you know, I've, I've never done a good thing or something to that effect. Or I never, I think what he was basically implying, whether or not it was a, an odd localized, translation was um i never got to do everything to the degree that i wanted to and i think maybe it's yeah well no artist is ever really satisfied with the end product right like you never 100 percent feel like yes that is exactly what i pictured i I, the the only time when i that i was just talking about this last night was with with the dream side first book i'm 100 percent satisfied but it took letting that sit for 13 years like the, yeah, the sometimes cost- I hate it for the first like year after I do it and I can't look at it. It makes me yeah. sick to my stomach. And then I look at it later and go, it's pretty good. It's pretty yeah. Good. yeah. Well, you hate that. like it. You, yeah, you hate it right away, but then you, you like yeah. it like five years later when you look back yeah. on it. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, but I just, it's funny about Miyazaki. I think when you have his brain, I think you're, you're only really constantly aware of how much did not come through. Yeah. Well, I think he's an actual genius with a very specific vision, working in an industry where you have to have a team working with you to make that vision come to life. So it's mm-hmm. so hard to be like, no, it's supposed to be exactly like this. I'm going to try and get you guys to do this, you know. But I mean, his contributions to animation are stellar. They just speak for themselves. I've yeah, been watching yeah. a lot more Miyazaki lately than anything else. And really, I, really I love his sensibilities. Really amazing. And so, yeah. And what's funny is, uh, so, so we met at Comic-Con and uh, oh, yeah. uh, I was sitting there at my little table and I had some of my dream side prints and Casey comes up and uh, is talking to me about, you know, the, the, the colors and, and all that stuff. And, and, and we just got talking about art in general. And it was yeah. funny because I remember Kay, Casey said, you know what you should do as long as you're pitching stories, you should pitch a rainbow bright book. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It'd be fun. It would be fun. Now, I did. I, I mean, the license that? isn't. I know the license isn't really available right now. No, but I not. still think your your art style would be very well suited to Rainbow oh, Bright. Right. And I, I have been wanting to do a Rainbow Bright reboot for a while because I think it would lend itself to the magical girl type of story so well. Mm-hmm. 
and you could just really reinvent it and make it this kind of fun space adventure with colors yeah. going after colored full stones yeah, like yeah. infinity stones <laughs> well it's funny with with rainbow break because I, I when i was I, I did actually contact hallmark and i asked them about mm -hmm. it and and apparently they had just made a deal with um uh ID, i think it was idw or yeah there, well there is a comic now anyway I yeah. think the first oh, well, issue that's good. i'm glad so i'm they, glad they're doing something with it. it's a fun property yeah but, but in the process in the thing what i really enjoyed was going back and i realized i never really watched uh rainbow bright since i was i was a really little kid like the, and I'm talking honestly the original i show. haven't either i almost don't want to revisit it i just want to go off no do do, do 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 okay one, okay because i'm always it, afraid it, that like when you go back and you love something as a kid you're just like oh it's bad no, well, some, some things do that but this one didn't because when i put it back on it has all the cheesiness that you would expect sure it was an 80s cartoon it, it also overwhelmingly hit me with like ways of nostalgia like it was really really potent with that one and it's surprisingly well done i was sitting here watching it and i thought and i thought you know surprisingly well done in the sense that it was a rushed cartoon in the 80s right. and somehow i just like the concept that each kid embodies a color and there's one girl who's all of the colors and she's kind of bringing everybody together and trying to bring color back to the world it is, it is a yeah it's it's a neat concept and it was funny because we were talking about how much fun it would be to work together on a on a rainbow oh my gosh, book. Yes. And so, you know i was thinking i'm like oh you know one of the things i say all the time now casey is that uh, God, you reach a point where you, you just have you you expend every ounce of energy you have, and you can't go fast enough to get everything. Oh done. yeah, no, I'm there and, right now. <laughs> and so eventually, you have to branch out and get some help. And it's funny because with uh, with this with Yuka, you know, who knows what will come next? And mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, well, I have some ideas, but the the, hmm. the fact of the matter is, you never really know. And opportunities come this is the way it works in the industry is opportunities yeah. will pop up and wh whether you're ready or not and mm -hmm. you have to so try to be ready yeah, yeah try right and uh, so it's it's um you don't want to say no to things that are really that are really good opportunities and this and then and then because because you might go for two years thinking that nobody will ever want to work with you uh and it, it's really frustrating and so uh who knows what will happen in terms of branching out with these properties. But I think if, if the Yuka book can become a success, then that can lead to a lot more interest because studios will understand that it's, it's a serious endeavor and they can, they can get a really good project yeah. out of it. Uh, but when that happens, I'll just say, yeah, I just want to say from my point of view, if the Yuka book is a success, then I'd be willing to put in the effort to put together something in that vein for another awesome indie title. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah and I need help. <laughs> So I can't, do, I can't do it all. And I like to help. No, yeah. I, that's what I'm about. I love getting in there, digging in, making the art good, being part mm -hmm. of a team, helping make stuff awesome. That's right. Now, I, I th that's probably a good segue into uh, directing people to your work. So where can people sure. find your work uh, kind of in general? Now, I did put links yeah. in the description, by the way. But, uh, oh, I'll thank you. you describe. Yeah, so uh, I would say the most up-to-date uh, way to find out about my work is on Instagram. It's just at Casey Robin. And then you can also find me on Facebook and Twitter. And those are at Casey Robin Art because I guess somebody beat me to the just Casey Robin ones. Uh, and then I have an Etsy as well where I post um, prints of my work that are available for sale. And uh, that's a good way to support my work. But as far as just following what I'm doing, I'd say Instagram is probably your best bet. I try mm -hmm. to post on all the platforms, but I, I feel Instagram is particularly well suited to visual posts i just wish so, that they would allow for links to be active yeah because like i'm like hey everybody on instagram come watch me on this thing here's the link you can't follow it sorry yeah, you gotta <laughs> you gotta like copy and paste the link and if you're on a phone yeah. it's just my yeah. guess would be that it's in an effort to deter uh, excessive scamming or advertising a lot of spam you know because mm, if, if links were live because even so I, I get yeah, but you know, it is frustrating because you just want to share. You're just like, oh, man, I am doing this cool thing and I want to share it with everybody. Here's the link. You can't use it. Crap. <laughs> but but yeah, I mean, always feel free to reach out to me. I sometimes it takes me a while, but I usually answer my messages that come through Instagram or Facebook or wherever. I'm, I'm still learning how to navigate Twitter well, but um, eventually your message will get to me if you you know, if you want to reach out. Um, but yeah, I tend to post on Instagram quite a bit. Right. Now, since we, we got to talking about Alice, uh, I, I have quite the collection of Alice books back here. <laughs> have you ever seen one of these before? No. This is a facsimile of the original uh, Alice's oh, nice. 
right. adventures. Well, it used to be called, it was called Alice's Adventures Underground. And uh, this was, this is a copy of the, obviously it wasn't hard bound like this, but this is the sort of from the manuscript that Lewis Carroll drew for mm -hmm. Alice Little, who's the name of the little girl he told the story to. Uh, little so what, Alice. This is, yes, Alice, well, her name was Al yeah, Actually, I know. Alice Her little. name was Little, but yeah. The, 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 she was the, the Little family. I think this was actually the actual uh, cover image for the, for the thing. It's cool. got all of his. He, he did his own. Oh, that really comes through. <laughs> he did his own illustrations for it, you know. And it's, I have the, uh, the edition of The Hobbit that was illustrated by Tolkien himself. He was not a bad illustrator. It's very cool to see his, his own uh, pictures put to his words. Oh, yeah, the, 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 the Tolkien drawings. Yeah, that's right. He did do yeah. his own drawings. Yeah, and I explained to you, I think we talked at one point about the golden afternoon phenomena, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, where he's talking about yeah. when he told the story. It's a really neat phenomenon about how it, your, your memory can be altered based on how much you're enjoying a, a day or something. How, you know, we remember days being sunny that were rainy. Yeah, Very apparently that golden afternoon that he wrote about was really a, a rainy day. A rainy day. But he felt so happy, it felt like a sunny day. Mm -hmm. Well, he got to get out of the, uh, Christchurch, England, so that probably <laughs> it, it's a little. I'm sure it was a little stuffy in there. So yeah, uh, those tend to be a little bit dark, a little bit stuffy. Yeah, they, yeah. they kind of have that that old incense smell that you get in older churches, oh, which yeah. which is mysterious and charming. But it's getting out into the fresh air feels good mm. after that. Mm -hmm. you know? Yes, and they were complicated outfits at that time. I imagine it was a it was quite an affair to uh, get ready for the day. <laughs> Oh yeah, you've got like the like robes and stoles, and I don't even know the proper terms. My my pastor still wears the um those long scarf things you put around your neck, but she just wears them over like regular clothes, mm. and yeah. and they're like made by different people in the congregation, so they're often like hand quilted or have butterflies on them or rainbows. Like they're very they're very snazzy, you know. Yeah, yeah they're like what, something. Sorry, I was gonna say, where where do you find something like that? Ah. Uh, I have no idea. They just seem to show up in churches, certain ones, <laughs> not yeah. not every church, but you, mine is Presbyterian, a... so it's a little bit old fashioned, at yeah. least in the dress. We're very progressive socially, but uh, the dress is very, it has a history. Well, I, I think a lot of times they're made by the people in the church. I see. I at see. least in well, our it, church. It, it is a church. It would make sense. It would have history. And I'm sure that you can order them off some website. I'm sure you mm -hmm. can because there are other churches I've been to where it's very manufactured looking. But the one she wears reminds me of something that like Titus from Kimmy Schmidt might wear and like wrap around him dramatically. Like they're very <laughs> bright and almost flamboyant. <laughs> they're fun. Yeah. I wish well, I knew yeah. the word for these. You know, church garbs. <laughs> yeah, know church garbs. Called. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a unique that's a that's a that's a that's an interesting description. I yeah, know, I wouldn't know where to begin finding something like that. So yeah, I well, I've I, never really thought about it before. Yeah, yeah. So so non licensed projects, dream yeah. projects, nothing, just totally off the wall. What's something that you would like okay. to do that you've never had really a chance to do? Oh gosh, um, non licensed. Yeah, yeah, like not not a licensed thing like what we've been talking about, but just so like something, something that's like original. I mean, I know you're doing your your project, but something well, that is off the wall. Uh, I want to do a musical. Oh, there I want to write go. the lyrics. Yeah, I want to bring something to stage, um, and maybe play a tiny part just in the background. You know, <laughs> I love musicals, and I'm pretty hokey, so that would be actually. I did a musical adaptation of Atlantis, The Lost Empire for my senior project in high school with my friend Richard Andreessen, who still does musicals to this day. Mm -hmm. And I got permission from Disney to adapt it. And I was like 16 and a huge nerd. So I just wrote all these Atlantis songs and I sent them to like Disney guys. So like Randy Haycock, who animated Princess Kita still knows me as that girl who did that Atlantis thing. And I'm like, Randy, I was yeah. like, 16 awesome. i'm so embarrassed of it now but i do love musicals so so yeah i'd like to do something for the stage yeah that's, i'd that's... also ooh, i want to art direct a, a production of the nutcracker like marie ooh. sindak did i think that'd be so fun like I costumes backgrounds oh yeah look up marie sindak nutcracker it looks like one of his books but on stage with live dancers it's so cool wow. or like you see chagall's designs for the ballet they're amazing okay. like i'd love to do that also i really want to design a pull-up doll 
Um, these are like Pull-up? big headed pullip. Yeah, P U L L I P. They are dolls from South Korea with big heads and really cute faces and great big anime eyes. And they have a collector's series where uh, artists kind of make their own pullip and then they're mass manufactured. Um, okay, and I, co- I collect. Now. So I'm, I've been a pullip collector for years and I would love to have one that I design. Oh, neat. I've seen these before. Aren't they cute? Yeah. These are, yeah, they do have big heads. They have the, yeah. the this. This is, um, I guess. A lot of them are like Lolita styled in their dress. I can yeah. grab one if you want to see. Yeah. The, the, it, it, is that one I'm seeing behind you there to your right? Oh, no. That's a Monster High doll that I repainted. Do oh, see yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Just, just a second. Yeah. yeah I, 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 do, I do want it. Now, so Casey, at one point when we were talking at, at Comic Con, had mentioned yeah. she sometimes we'll repaint dolls. And so I just think that's the coolest thing. So let's take a look at this. Okay. Okay. So. Here she is. Neat. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Her name's Julia, and she's borrowed a pull-ups outfit. So this is just something I do for fun. You know, I just like to paint the face up and make it really soft and pretty. There are people on YouTube who are much better doll repainters than I am, but this is just a hobby of mine. That um looks pretty amazing to me. <laughs> thank you. Well, I was saying that your character from Dreamside, Sarah, I think would make an amazing doll custom, you know, I, I that am, if the day I'm... ever comes. I am I am uh, re- ready and waiting anytime you want to do that. Okay. Well, I was going to kind of wait till you were doing like a big Kickstarter push or something, you know, oh, that's, something that's, you uh, could use it for. Oh, that's next. Yeah, that's that's next. We're going to probably yeah. do that next summer. Uh got to get got to get Yuka out, but now I I do have one crazy possibility for the for the Dreamside Kickstarter that would be a yeah. very cool integration. But we have to see if I can make this relationship happen with with uh, this uh, company. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm trying to do something special for Dreamside. You know, it's it's been so long. Oh, I think I know what you might be thinking. I have I, an idea, but oh, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we'll see because I, you know, it's it's it would. Let's put it this way: it would, in a, it, it has to involve smarter people than me in order <laughs> to make it a reality. And I have but to that's get... the great thing about the world: it's filled with people smarter than me. It's filled with I... people smarter than me. That's right. <laughs> Yeah. And and le- and less smart sometimes. You but know, that, you that, just partner with someone whose strengths complement yours, and you can make something awesome. Well, that that is funny because that's both a really positive and negative statement, isn't it? Like the the world is full right? of people who are way smarter than me, and then it's like, hey, wait, <laughs> things are okay because there's a, there are a lot of smarter people than me, right. keeping things well, in and, check. And to be clear, I mean smarter in different areas. For example, I'm very smart when it comes to words and pictures, but when it comes to numbers, no, you know. So I'm glad there are tax attorneys or accountants. Yeah. I mean, you know, people who do numbers. I'm glad that studios have people who make sure people get paid the right amount every week. You know. Yes. That's- Yes. Yeah. I, and I'm glad that there are doctors and scientists because Lord knows I'm not one. Yeah. I wouldn't be able to do that either. Yeah. These dolls are but amazing. But I appreciate it. Huh? Yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the, dolls, the pull-up dolls? dolls? Yeah. Yeah. The proportion would Wait, be awesome. I, I kind of want to, I want to show people one. Can I grab one? Yeah. 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 Like, please do. I, I talked about them and I feel like I'm just teasing people by saying, oh, they're really pretty. You I, can't see them. I think you just should just, just, just grab them all. Hang on. Well, I have a box here. Oh no. Oh boy. Uh oh. Just a second. Uh-oh. Okay. Issues. It's the cord. <laughs> yes. So, uh, if yes, if anybody has any uh, any uh, more questions, please ask them. Jonathan Taylor, Dreamside the video game. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that would be an ambitious video game. That's a okay. that's a, quite a, a big story there to uh, turn into a game. I, Dreamside could be a video game. I've thought about it a few chi- times, but it's it's a very 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 tight knit linear story. Oh, let's yeah. see what Casey's got here. This is an Alice. So this is their romantic Alice, which was a uh, kind of Victorian inspired line. And one of the neat things about pull-up dolls is that they can sleep. So you can open their eyes. Let me just do it off screen. Cause it's a little bit creepy if you do it on screen. Cause oh, it kind of looks like the doll's alive and well, that's well, sort no, of weird that's people. Great. <laughs> we we want to see the creepy doll. <laughs> so there she is. is oh, she wow. It really and comes alive. If you want to see, right? If you want to see her look alive, like, let me find the right switch. Hang on. Wait, does she move? Is she, is, is that electronic? Oh, what's going to happen? Whoa. Hey, now I got to switch over to you. Yeah. So wait, wait, their eyes it... can move. Whoa. That's neat. 
Isn't that cool? The idea being that you can pose her for pictures and then have her like look away or look at the camera. Or the you only can Im you can terrify people. Oh yeah, no, I do frequently. <laughs> um, just like welcome to my room. I hope you're not afraid of dolls. If you are, then um, they're coming for you. Just a very <laughs> subtle eye movement when, when, when I you're know, just right? sitting, sitting but the, there. But the face yeah. is so pretty. I just love the level of exaggeration. Also, I'm a big fan of this Lolita style. So yeah. Pull up people. If you're listening, June planning, I want to do one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's, I mean, I mean, if we got pinup girls, so why not? <laughs> oh, yeah, but, but that's for people. I want to make a little, little doll. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, for sure. Yeah, but, uh, but yeah, with Sarah, it's a challenge because Sarah's tough because she's, she's, um, she's tough because she, she's a simple design. Uh, mm -hmm. And she's not terribly, Dis she's a little disproportionate she's a little exaggerated in the head but she's but pretty naturalistic she's, she's pretty she's, close she's, to real proportions and she also one of the one of the most fun things about working on on that project and yuga is actually the same way and um but for a totally different reason is the whereas yuga is is very much i i tend this, i used to have these conversations with animators about exaggeration and mm -hmm. uh how much i i always disliked that element of, of animation to a degree, I know I was always as much as I love animation history my personal favorite stuff was always kind of the Disney Renaissance Glenn Keane stuff which mm -hmm. airs very close to the natural world you know yeah yeah I mean it, exaggeration is wonderful when you can use it I love it when it goes all the way like Roger Rabbit style uh but in, in oh which, Roger Rabbit scared me <laughs> yeah well but it's exaggerated but that's that's what something wonderful animation can do I mean yes, you just watch true. Judge Doom when you're nine and you know you right don't, don't sleep for a week and I do think you should have a reason for your animated project why it's animated like it shouldn't just be something you could have just filmed with live people but you made it animated because yeah like there yeah. should be something like the genie in Aladdin mm. had a lot of morphing and things that just were very natural to the realm of animation yeah, and it can it can be wonderful, but you know, with 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 Dreamside, for example, the you know, I made sure not to. I don't break anything. Uh, that sounds horrible, but I don't break yeah. the, the characters. Uh, <laughs> but you don't sense. go around breaking little girls' legs. I don't, in the I don't. Yeah, not in book one anyway. Oh, I had you pegged all wrong, man. No, no, no. Yeah, no, no, no broken legs. No, 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 no broken legs. But the the poses have to feel very natural and and organic. And that means really thinking about that before and after, which I was talking about before. Mm -hmm. But so much of it is just, you know, I oh, just, you know, the leg is just a little unnatural. I just nudge it over. You know, if yeah. I was sitting here in this state of mind, I, you know, I would kind of relax in just this way and right. just this shoulder would raise up a little bit and it would kind of scrunch and maybe the head's kind of ducking down a little more than I drew. Well, and I draw from life a lot, a lot of gesture drawing, a lot of life drawing in the studio and after a time you develop a sort of instinct where you just know what feels natural mm -hmm. you know yeah. what's a natural way to sit i used to call my my buddies and i the life drawing mafia back in school nice. because we would just uh, we would just come into classes that weren't our classes and sit down and start oh drawing. i did that too yeah, no, I just came into whatever class had the life drawing and be like, I'm here now. Well, they never cared. The, the, the teacher was always happy. <laughs> no, they were fine. They were happy that we wanted to learn. Mm -hmm. That's right. And it wasn't like I wasn't a student of that school. You like, it'd be a little you. different. But... You have to do You have to do your figure drawing. You have to do oh, it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's something that I kind of want to get back to more academic drawing. I feel like I've been doing so much production drawing that I want to get back to drawing for the sake of learning, just it's, for learning. You know, it's funny. You're, this is the opposite of the conversation I had with Eddie Pittman on, uh, on, on uh, Tuesday, mm -hmm. uh, because Eddie and I were, were joking about how often it is that you talk to people who are um, getting older and older and older and are in the animation industry, who might have great jobs or have done work for great studios. And then they're, you know, they're 55 and they say, you know, one of these days I got to teach myself how to make something. And it, it always kind of cracks me up because I'm thinking, yeah. just get into it. And you're kind of the opposite. You got into it early. Yeah. And well, I kind of had to, I was, I reached this point in my career where it was sort of sink or swim. And I had to just start trying stuff just to make something go. Cause I didn't have any money. So I had to be well, like, that's a good motive. You know, do you like this? Do you like this? I can do this. I can do that. You know, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, and, and, and of course it was all stuff I cared about and liked, but I, I didn't have the luxury of staying back and being afraid too much. I, I mean, to some degree, that's always with every artist, but I just out of desperation needed to try things and it, it made me a stronger artist. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. You know, and I'm glad now because I think I used to think 
that I was a nobody and that I needed a company like Disney to come and be a big name and that no one would ever want me just for being Casey, you know, but because I, I had a time where I took some time to develop my own style and I realized I had a following and all that kind of thing. I, I feel a sense of confidence now that like, Hey, the reason people like me is because I'm being myself. And that sounds so cheesy. It's so like, just be yourself. But like, I was trying to kind of get the stamp of approval from a company. And at a certain point, I realized the really valuable thing is you yourself, your perspective, your, your style, your sensibilities, you know, your heart, what you bring to the table as a member of any team or project. And then you, you get the, the wonderful sense of satisfaction of creating something uh, original and having that record. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's really cool. And that's where I'm, why I'm putting so much effort into, into Medusa and into these dresses and into the stuff that I'm doing that's just me and isn't, you know, a, a property or a no name is it's, it's intensely satisfying. It's scary when you start, but if you just keep going, it's, it's some of the best satisfaction you'll ever feel as an artist. Of mm -hmm. course, I love working with existing properties too, though, because then the challenge is how to keep it interesting, how to adapt it for this market, for, for mm -hmm. books or, you know, for animation or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I, I think, uh, so, so we're, we're actually getting up on two hours. Can yeah, we should that? probably wrap up. Well, I was, I, I would be, I would be remiss. I, I like being able to say remiss because it makes me sound, <laughs> I, I would be remiss if I did not ask you for any advice for uh, aspiring artists or people who want to move in a, a direction similar to what you've done. Sure. Um, well, I'd say the first thing is draw a lot when you're younger, go ahead and draw, draw your fan art, draw your anime art, draw all of that kind of stuff. But also take care to draw from nature, draw real people, draw your friends when they're not looking. Um, and it seems embarrassing at first, but if you're really embarrassed to draw gesture drawings out in public, you can go to like the mall and people won't notice you. Or sometimes they go to Ikea and everyone's busy shopping for furniture and they don't notice me sketching them in the cafe or wherever. So that's important. And then beyond that, I'd say it's important to try to make a lot of work that's original as soon as you can. I really started when I got out of school and it's something that I still try to prioritize. I feel like lately I've been working on so many of other people's things that I wanna get back to more of my own. Um, but that will help you find your voice. Don't feel like you have to wait to have a style before you start making art. Like make pictures and make ones in, in different styles, like experiment. I think the other thing too, the big thing for me has been not to compare yourself to others and really, really try very hard not to become a copy of anybody else. I, I, that's a mistake I see a lot of students making right now is they see like one artist that they love and they just copy their style and get really good at, at pretending to be them. but you can't be a better, you know, whoever than, than they are. Like, like for me, okay, I, I grew up loving Glen Keane. Like I loved Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast. So I couldn't be a better Glen Keane than Glen Keane is. But what I can do is be inspired by his approach to drawing from nature and then caricaturing it and drawing with a lot of emotion feeling um and then i bring to it a lot of my own sensibilities my love of the 50s my love of girly stuff and simplicity and that creates something new you know so i mean it's cool to have your influences just make sure you have a broad a broad variety of influences and that you're trying a lot of different stuff but don't worry about like what's my style what's my style like that comes by making work that's how that happens so just make a lot of work you know yeah and try to be and do a whole lot of figure drawing, right? Yes, do a lot of figure drawing and a lot of quick gestures of both people and animals that will just give you a wonderful foundation to be able to create things. Right. Now, I, I, um, before we go, I want to show something here. Uh, so for people who are following the ukulele uh, campaign progress, you might know that I did a Twitter contest to do a, uh, a giveaway for an art print. Oh, yeah. Yeah. of the uh the cover art so now i i was i was I, I like to call this a little bit of a white lie here because what i did was I, I showed a print that was actually something that i did on my printer at home just to kind of capture the the interest but uh i actually had intended to go and get a really fancy print made and you know oh, we did pick, we, yeah on was, satin 
Oh, it's fancier. <laughs> it's fancier. It's on the paper. Well, you know the paper, Casey, because of the paper I used at Comic Con, mm -hmm. uh, and so we uh, we did we did pick a winner. But I wanted to show off the print to people here. So the the interesting thing about this. So this is I don't know how well this is going to work, but basically it's on this, this metallic paper that just uh, pretty. Yeah, it it has this kind of like really amazing effect to it, which nice. just blows my mind. I don't I don't know how well it shows up on me. This, this I'm getting I'm getting the vibe of it. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm really happy uh, at how this is coming out. This is the cover art from the book, and so I do actually have uh, another one of these that I'm going to be giving away again. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what stage we're going to do it, but probably when the campaign is funded. I know that uh, that Platonic has agreed to give away uh, at least one. I think of the Nintendo 64 replica cartridges. Uh oh my gosh i want one yes yes Can I, enter? I do too Am I allowed to... hey i don't still have one i don't have one so uh, uh <laughs> i don't, I don't I... know what i have to do to get one i mean if, if making the graphic novel isn't enough then i i don't know yeah you gotta make um two graphic novels and yeah, a line well, of choice well there, well there we go and i think that's a good motivation <laughs> so um what i'm gonna do is i'm just going to very quickly post because i have to uh shill for my project here where is my project yep. link? I am going to. And let's not be this. shy, everybody. Yes. If you haven't already supported the Kickstarter, please do. It helps so much. And if you know anyone who might like it, please share. It really helps. Yes, please do, and uh, and and it will be a fantastic project. And please support Casey. You can find her links, as I said, in the uh, description of the video. And uh, so, do we have any last minute questions before we go? Mm -hmm. Anybody? Anyone? Care? Yes. Drag Mundus says, "Be unique with a smiley face." I think that's mm -hmm. good. Well, and I think be unique kind of comes naturally. You know, it comes out of being yourself, you know? It's hard We're to all avoid. Of... Right. Yeah, I think well, the more not... you do, the more you'll naturally. You know, my, my, yeah. my, 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 my simple uh, advice uh, on that regard is just to, just do it. It's kind of like, uh, you know, you want to do something you don't know how, but the, the first step is always just to begin. And yeah, you, you just kind of jump in. Out. You figure out as you go, you know, because you'll come, you'll hit your first wall. And then, well, yeah, my first Disney job uh, the, with the Disney publishing, I didn't know what I was doing. I had had like one hour of training and it was not enough. And so I, I had to kind of flounder and, and not fail, but have trouble and then go back to my art director and be like, how do I um, make the lines color colored lines? How do I do it? I mean, well, there was a very specific way she liked it done that, that you were not to do it any other way. And yeah. I'm like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah so even yeah. when you're a professional you are learning sometimes you're learning as you go right you just you just jump in but but and uh you have to have a goal of some kind you have something yes. that you're shooting toward it, it'll keep it'll hold 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 you through the challenges it gives you a reason to push through the hard parts well and my mom says a goal is a dream with a deadline because the dream you could be like oh someday someday i'd like to do this or that but a goal is like okay um, this year I'm going to write my graphic novel and get it to a place where it's sellable or something like that. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Yes. Uh, and uh, Harry Moore design says thumbs up. Oh, thanks Harry. Harry's a guy I work with a lot in, in the world of games. So he does the color. I do the pencils. It's a really fun, really fun collaboration. What, what does that mean? Oh, like, you know, like Hasbro games and stuff. Uh, Monopoly, that kind of thing. They always need art for that sort of thing. So Harry oh, and I make art for sometimes game boxes. Sometimes it's for uh, picture books. We've done several Paw Patrol books together. The Paw Patrol Christmas book, some, something Harry and I did together. Wow. So, okay. Yeah. I did hey, not, Harry. I, I didn't know you did that. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't. I I just I help with the pencil stage. So a, a lot of it really is what you're seeing in the final page is Harry. Right. But I, as I said, I like jumping in and helping. I like drawing cute dogs. So. You know? Yeah, yeah. Cute <laughs> dogs and cute dolls. Yeah. Right. Dogs and dolls. That's life. <laughs> dogs and dolls. Dogs and dolls. That's life. <laughs> I was in Guys and Dolls in high school. Of course, I was heavy back then, so I didn't get any good parts. I had to be the uh, Killjoy General Cartwright, like the lady who wanted to shut down all the fun. And I'm just like, <laughs> darn it. I wanted nice. the cute part. <laughs> it, was still cute a, part. it was a fun show. Well, yeah, because there's all these uh, cute little hot box girls, like little dancers. Hot and box. I wanted to be one of them. Hot box yeah. girl. Oh, but they're just like little, they're just like little uh, dinner theater show dancers in cutie little outfits. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. yeah I, I used to wear those, so I, I should. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. 
I could pull it off. My, my dad did a lot of uh, dinner theater and a lot of off-Broadway musical theater. So I kind of come from a musical theater background. Mm-hmm. So I have a, a great love of it. All right. That makes sense. I'll tell you what. Yeah. Why don't we wrap up? And I'll t- this, this, this was fantastic. It was a lot of fun. And I think we had some great conversation. And, and Sorry we derailed that, so much. Great questions, the- guys. Well, I was gonna. I was gonna say sorry. We we ended up derailing so much into talking about y- mm-hmm. Yuka, but I, I I want. There's so many more questions, honestly, that that I think people would would love to hear from you about. So we should do this again. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was fun times. Mm-hmm. Thank you and for so having I'll, me on. I'll be hitting you up sooner rather than later to do that. So pre- prepare your schedule. <laughs> All right. Just All right. Give me a couple uh, days notice. Well, thank you so much for taking the time, and everybody, thank you so much for for joining us. And uh, we yeah, will thank see you guys. You, we will see you next time. All right. Bye, Bye-bye. David. Bye, everyone.